Uh, can I get a sound check, please? Sound check, testing one, two, three. Thank you. Test. Test. Testing for the captioners. Testing for the captioners. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. This is the Health and Hospital Committee for our County of Santa Clara, uh, scheduled for two o'clock. That time has arrived. So we are going to begin with the call to order, which includes a roll call to establish the presence of a quorum. Vice Chairperson Lee. Present. Chairperson Smidian. Present. So that means we have Supervisor Otto Lee and Supervisor Joe Simidian present. That takes us to public comment. Public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for comment by members of the public on non-agendized items that are properly within the purview of this committee. Let me ask uh, the clerk how many cards we have. We have one. Do we have anyone on Zoom? Yes, one person. One person on Zoom. All right. We're gonna. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask the clerk to uh, let folks who want to speak on uh, public comment uh, online on Zoom, uh, let's take one more minute and then say that's the end of that queue. So if uh, you're out there in Zoom land and would like to participate in public comment, please uh, go ahead and get yourself a uh, raised hand. And uh, meanwhile, we'll take the one speaker we have here in chambers. That is uh, Eric Peterson. And uh, Madam Clerk, my recollection is that when we have fewer than uh, five or fewer folks, we provide up to three minutes. That is correct. All right, Eric Peterson, please come on up to the microphone. And there is a microphone embedded there, even though it doesn't look like it. So if you just stand at the podium and speak oh, up. Oh, I believe you. All right, go to it. Uh, board members, the reason I'm here is um, you've delegated a policy to the CEO of your uh, health care and that policy is not implemented. It's been almost three years. I've personally experienced it. The problem is, is if a patient makes an accusation of neglect, it's supposed to be immediately taken care of in the rest management. Uh, this is a supplement uh, for item two. It's a written comment that I'm also reading off of. 
a lack of notification of the director of care and management, as well as the hospital medical director on um, questions of premature discharge. And the problem with the policy is the policy is supposed to inform patients, family, and staff, and the hospital does not do that. Does not inform you that you can um, exercise your rights to outside agencies prior to um, following their process. Also, the customer relations department, which handles their grievances, does not explain the reason for the delay, status, or approximate time when the grievance will be resolved. My grievance has not been resolved for over two months. To add insult to injury, they have not escalated it. It will be escalated to the grievance committee as well as the hospital administrator. That's item six. Item seven is the program manager has not um, facilitated the resolution of the com complex complaint by timely escalation to the medical leadership, facilitation of meetings with individuals and hospital personnel, collaboration with the hospital administration, review by the grievance committee, and last but not least, most importantly, reports the information to the hospital administration, the governing body, and the grievance committee. So what I'm asking for is immediate corrective action. This is state and federal compliance, and before you have death or decertification, which happened with non-compliance for your, medic, uh, your mental protocols at VMC, that's what happened. So that's why I want this addressed. It impacts everybody in the county. Thank you very much. And for those of you who have not been uh, to our committee meetings or board meetings uh, previously, uh, I should just observe that uh, by virtue of Brown Act open meeting laws, we're not in a position to respond uh, particularly extensively or certainly not to take action when we are approached on something that's not on the agenda. Uh, but uh, please know that that uh, nevertheless um, allows you to raise the issue and to ensure that it gets heard. So I'll look to Mr. Lorenz, who will nod. I hope that he uh, heard the message loud and clear. I'll look to our county executive, who will nod. I hope that he heard the message loud and clear. And I, without even asking, I got the county council's office, Mr. Press, down at the other end to nod that he heard the message loud and clear. Uh, and um, we will ask folks just to follow up on the issues raised in the public comment. Now, I believe while Mr. Uh, Peters was speaking, uh, Peterson, excuse me, sir. Um, we had another card come in, is that correct, Madam Clerk? No, it was for item five. Another item, all right. That means we turn then to Zoom, where we have still one person or more, now two, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the two folks in Zoom and turn, and again, up to three minutes, please. Our first speaker is Kenneth Horowitz. Kenneth, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Ken Horowitz from your Health Advisory Commission. And I want to report that um, in the past few months, uh, we've had four resignations of members of our Health Advisory Commission due to various personal and um, other reasons. And so what I'm asking, uh, a couple things, if there are any uh, residents listening to this telecast. Um, if you are interested in uh, participating in the Health Advisory Commission, you can find it on the Clerk of the Board's website, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the Health Advisory Commission. And so as I mentioned, there are at least four openings at this time. And the second part um, is to ask the, the members of the Board of Supervisors including Supervisor Samidian and Supervisor Lee, if you would ask your staff, your appointment staff, um, to look after our 
any applications on file from the clerk of the board of persons that would be interested in serving on the Health Advisory Commission. Um, again, if you have any interest in serving on the Health Advisory Commission, you need to contact the clerk of the board. Their telephone number is 408-299-5000. Thank you for your time, and I wish all of you happy holidays. Thank you very much, Dr. Horst, and I believe our next speaker is queued up. Yes, our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Paul, go ahead. Um, you're a little bit spotty, but yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I think I just might um, consider submitting my application for that position. A large part of my advocacy is centered on the institutionalization of racial equity within the context of every single department of this county. But I have a primary interest in health and health care and how racist policies have affected, or should I say infected, my community over generations. And so, the Health Advisory Commission would benefit from the experience, the life experience, and the experiences of the Chicano community within that commission because is that we have to get a legal definition of what racial equity means. And, and the reason is because whenever there's going to be a budget allocation that's going to come up, that's when all the political machinations start you know, grinding their gears and people start lobbying and people start falling uh, for position to get access to those resources. What Racial, uh, what, what the institutionalization of a racial equity definition, a legally binding definition would do is exclude a lot of that because you would have to adhere to the objective, not the guiding principle. I don't care about no guiding principle. Guiding principle ain't going to amend and, 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 and turn back a lot of the conditions that have infected my community for the last hundred years, at least. So... There is a, there was a, uh, a challenge in this, in the Supreme Court regarding uh, reverse discrimination because the University of Wisconsin does not have a legally binding definition for racial equity. And so what that did is that that left it open for interpretation. And what the lawyers did is they came in and they exploited that fact that there was some legally binding definition for racial equity within the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. And because of that, those lawyers exploited that and they, they had to drop their policy. And actually, uh, people that were trying to institute the policies on behalf of those uh, principles, they got laid off. So there's only been victims in the court systems regarding the lack of a racial equity. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you uh, very much uh, to our speakers. And um, as the clerk has indicated, that apparently is the final speaker for uh, our public comment period. That takes us to item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes, if any, to the committee's agenda. Um, that being said, Supervisor Lee, we could use a motion to approve the consent calendar, uh, but I'm uh, mindful of the fact that we have a long agenda today, and I'm hoping that there are a few items we could put on consent in addition. 
Uh, and let me just be clear with folks who are here. Um, there will be an opportunity to speak if we put one of your items on consent and you want to speak to it. Uh, but also, I should be uh, absolutely clear, many of these items are quite important items. It's uh, consent uh, placement simply means there are clear reports from staff, thank you, or that there are no outstanding questions, thank you again. Uh, so please don't uh, view it in any other way. Um, Supervisor Lee, in addition to the proposed consent calendar, uh, I would um, suggest the possibility of putting items seven, eight, 10, 11, 13, and 15 on consent. Again, those are items seven, eight, 10, 11, 13, and 15, and it occurs to me that some folks who are here for a particular item or are listening may not have their item number handy, so seven deals with uh, recommendations from the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement uh, monitoring uh, with respect to health services, uh, eight deals with uh, enforcement of tobacco and uh, vaping uh, and nitrous oxide issues. 11 uh, deals with uh, Medi-Cal eligibilities. Again, some of these are very big issues, but um, we seem clear about where we are. 13 is uh, about the progress on our child and adolescent psychiatric facility. Uh, and 15 is about efforts to establish a new Valley Health Center in the North County. So in addition to our regularly proposed consent calendar, uh, if you're amenable, I would take a, a motion to uh, approve the consent calendar and the agenda as published with the addition of items 7, 8, 10, 11, 13, and 15. Hold on just a minute. Please do not shout out. We just don't do that in these chambers. And everybody gets heard, so hang on. I would uh, entertain a motion. Once we have a motion, if people want to speak, they can, and we'll call them up. Uh, and Supervisor Lee, you may have different items you want to add. You may have some of those items you want to hear. So let me turn to you for the motion. <clears throat> yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I've, I've not ever been to a uh, committee meeting where we have 19 items on the uh, <laughs> not on consent. So uh, thank you for the attempt to do all that. And I agree with all of them except item number 10 where I do have some uh, questions. So I would like to make the motion to move uh, the consent item and ad additional adding items number 7, 8, 11, 13, and 15 on to the consent as well. Got it. All right, that is the motion by Lee. I will second, and then we will say on item number three, which is the approval of the consent calendar, including those items, and changes to the committee agenda, if there's anyone who would like to speak, please fill out another yellow card and turn it into the clerk. Uh, and if you have turned in a card on one of those items, not knowing it was gonna uh, potentially end up on consent, I'll ask the clerk to bring that up, and we'll also ask uh, for anyone on Zoom who would like to speak to any of the items on consent, including the items that Supervisor Lee just listed, 7, 8, 11, 13, and 15, uh, to raise their virtual hands right now. All right, and for those of you who, again, who uh, are unfamiliar with this process, we have a up to two minute rule for items uh, for after the public comment. Great. All right, Mr. Eric Peterson, uh, item number three uh, regarding item number 24, which was on our regular consent calendar, which was to approve policies and procedures for Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Welcome, sir. Well, I'd like to apologize. I was directed that when the item came up, I had to speak before the motion. That's my concern. Not to worry. So I'd request that you remove item 24 from the consent calendar so that it can be discussed and have uh, action taken on it. Supervisor Lee, we can either remove it and take up the question later, or you can leave it on consent. We can ask the gentleman to speak to his concerns now. What's your preference, sir? Um, given the length of today's uh, meeting, I would ask to, to leave on consent for 9B, and you can speak on it, and if there's any more changes. Uh, again, your concerns is now being heard by the highest level of this county, and we would definitely address those right. from both the county council, county exec's office as well. So, Mr. Peterson, as the motion now stands, Forgive me, let me speak right in there. As the motion now stands, 
Uh, that item 24 remains on consent. I've heard you say that you have concerns about item 24. So why don't you go right ahead and articulate those concerns and uh, we will either approve it, deny it, or take it off consent after we've heard from you, sir. Okay, so here's my concern. If you're going to approve procedures, please have them implemented. That's as concise as I can say it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn to our clerk now, who seems to have gone to the phone a friend option uh, and uh, has some tech support handy. And let me just ask, uh, do we have folks who are online who would like to comment on Zoom? I currently have three, and let me say I have the best phone of friends ever. <laughs> there you go, all right. All right, so our first speaker today is the Black Leadership Kitchen. We have asked you to unmute. All right, let's hear from our first speaker. Go right ahead and welcome. Good afternoon, Chairperson Simini and Vice Chairperson Lee and staff. I am calling on behalf of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet of Silicon Valley for item 22. We appreciate the efforts put forth by the County Board of Supervisors and the members of the Race and Health Disparities Community Board. However, we have some significant concerns. There was a notable lack of representation from the Black community on the Race and Health Disparities Community Board. Representation is a fundamental pillar of a thriving community, and it is imperative that our voices are central to the decisions made around racial and health disparities in Santa Clara County. It is our understanding also that there was a significant amount of funds dedicated to a consultant that was not competitively sourced and was not from a BIPOC led organization. Given the community board is intended to develop solutions for BIPOC persons in this county, it is short sighted and thoughtless to not choose a consultant with lived experience as a BIPOC person navigating the systemic racism and inequities embedded in our healthcare systems. Further, we are concerned that these funds could have been better purposed to serve the community. Given that there are so many community experts, the funds that were dedicated to the consultant could have been used toward implementing one of the numerous recommendations that have been outlined in the population health assessments or other health equity related work groups and task forces. The BLKC insists that there continue to be funds dedicated to the Afrocentric community health centers who are experts in what it takes to eliminate racial and health disparities and that the county be more thoughtful around how funds dedicated to racial and health disparities are used. We have submitted a letter with our information as written comments to the clerk of the board and are available for follow-up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, BLKC, for being in the house. You're welcome here anytime. I need the help, bro. I'm serious. I need the help. Your presence is welcome. Your your the, your advocacy is heard, but now we need to make it felt and make it visible and, and viable and concrete. And 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 so I'll be getting hold of you after this call. And I'll get your contact information for you. Now there is a an issue with that particular policy being instituted, and here's why: it's premature. Supervisor Arenas commissioned a report that is going to quantify over generations the impact of racism on the Chicano and Mexicano communities specifically. So this report, you're gonna be able to extract a lot of data and information from that in order to inform your policies and your positions of the BLKC. So, I invite you to, to stay around, and if not, I'll keep you informed because they're moving too quick. We don't even have that, that the information in that report is incomplete because it doesn't include the information that is uh, being produced right now from Arenas. So I would ask that it be held off because you're actually accepting a report that you know definitively is incomplete. 
and that does a disservice to the public and the nonprofits that are local, they're the ones that are driving it and crafting the language. Why? Because they're going to exploit that language in order to support their paychecks. And they're not going to do anything about what the real issues are. Why don't you start accepting some assistance from people that have no monetary uh, uh, incentive other than justice for their people? And I believe we have one other speaker. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Thank and you very much. Let's go to that next speaker. Um, it looks like they just lowered their hand. BLK representative, did you wish to speak? All right. It looks like the answer is no. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us then to a vote, I believe, on this item. And just to clarify uh, on item 22, turning to the county, excuse me, the county executive and or the county's um, team here, the, uh, the semi-annual report um, is by definition semi-annual, which means if there's new information, it will be incorporated in the next report. Do I have that right? Yes, that's right, and I believe this uh, you know, this body just got extended by action on Tuesday at the Board yes. of Supervisors. All right. All right, thank you. With that duly noted, Supervisor Lee, you have a motion that stands, and uh, it is to approve the agenda order and the consent calendar is contained in our published agenda with the addition of items 7, 8, 11, 13, and 15 to the consent calendar. I believe I have that correct. Yes, sir? Yes. All right, then we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Sumidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, then we are on to item number four, which is to receive the report from the public health officer relating to COVID-19. Dr. Rudman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Vice Chair. You have a number of items today uh, from the Public Health Department, so I'll be brief with our COVID and respiratory disease update today. Um, starting by sharing the COVID wastewater trend, where unfortunately we're seeing high levels in both the San Jose and Palo Alto sewer sheds and rising levels in both Sunnyvale and Gilroy. And that's been somewhat sustained since prior to the Thanksgiving holiday. So as a reminder for everyone, it is not too late to come up to date with COVID vaccination to help protect uh, from severe disease and spread during this time. In addition, we are seeing um, that our RSV rates continue to rise, uh, as is typical for the season, but as continues to put our youngest residents and oldest residents at risk for severe disease. And the same is true for flu, although we are in a better place for flu than we were this time last year. Two additional updates. First is that uh, as of our most recent data, about a third of county residents are up to date on their annual flu shot and about 18% are up to date on their annual COVID vaccination. Uh, and these data are now up, uh, available um, and updated regularly on a new county dashboard that is updated to include the most recent COVID vaccination. And so folks can go to that county dashboard and see the most uh, recent information as well as breakdowns by rates and ethnicity and other factors. And then finally, at the recommendation of this body and Supervisor Simidian, um, some changes were made to the Public Health Department's website to help make it that much easier to find someone's healthcare provider and understand the best place for folks to go to find their COVID as well as flu vaccines. And so you'll find those augmentations to the Public Health website live at COVID-19 dot sccgov.org. And that concludes my presentation and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first check with the clerk, see if we have any cards on this item. I have no cards, but I do have a couple of Zoom speakers. All right, Supervisor Lee, why don't we uh, ask for the Zoom speakers and uh, let's give each of them up to two minutes and uh, we will cut off the access to the queue at after the first speaker has concluded his or her remarks. All right. All right, our first speaker is Kay Dale Compare. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello. 
Uh, my name is Karen Dukampare. Um, calling in regards to the measures taken for COVID-19, in particular, the masking requirements in healthcare. Um, these masking requirements are completely unnecessary. They do nothing to stop the spread of COVID or influenza. The studies have proven this, and it's puzzling to me why we're one of the very few places in the world that's still doing this. Um, and it's hurting people, actually. I've come into contact with people, you know, who have respiratory conditions, asthma, and so forth, and uh, it exacerbates their conditions to wear a mask. So why are we putting healthcare workers and patients through this? Um, it's, it's really, really uh, terrible. Um, the other issue I have is why are we still pushing COVID vaccines when they don't prevent the infection? They don't prevent the severity of illness. And there's a lot of data come out, uh, particularly uh, from New Zealand, and uh, Steve Kirsch has analyzed it. And it shows that uh, the COVID vaccine actually increases mortality. Let me say that again. The COVID vaccine increases mortality. This shouldn't come as a surprise because even in the Pfizer's own documents, more people died in the vaccine group than in the placebo group. So. Even if you're not dying from COVID, if you're dying from a heart attack or blood clots or some other condition, doesn't that still count? Shouldn't we look at overall mortality? And where's the data from Santa Clara County? We have data now that's been leaked from New Zealand, but where's the data from Santa Clara County showing that these COVID vaccines are decreasing overall mortality? I'd love to see that data. Thank you. And our next speaker, please. And again, the queue should be established at this point. Thank you. Our next speaker, our final speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, Dr. Bredman, I'd ask that you not personalize my comments. Um, I like you. You're, you're very uh, objective and informative and you make the information accessible. However, and I'm going to continue to reiterate this every single time one of these reports come out because of the vulnerability of the Chicano community in Barrio Salsipuedes. Now, my community experienced the largest portion of COVID deaths and the largest portions of COVID infections. These are just facts. And this county is not taking necessary steps within these reports in order to tell me that my community is going to receive special attention because of their uh, because of their vulnerabilities and that vulnerability i'm not going to continue to remind you of it because it's disgusting for a member of that of the chicano community in sasi puedes to have to come to these meetings and continue to remind you that we're human beings, we're here, we work in the construction sites, we work in the motels, we work in the food service industries, we wash, we pick, we box, we stack, we drive, we mop, we clean, we cook, we serve, we hammer, we drill. This is what the Chicano and the Mexicanos do. We are the backbone of this community. We are the backbone of the economy. And you are not taking viable steps in order to ensure the protections of my elders, of the children, and of the, of, you know, the uh, healthcare workers that take care of those children within the context of childcare. I wanna see in the next report what the county's position is and what they're gonna do to ensure the protection of the community that was most vulnerable during COVID. And this concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, and let me just confirm there's no one else here in chambers who has submitted a card. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? That is correct. All right, then. Supervisor Lee, this uh, is item number four, just uh, to receive the report from the public health officer, but of course, if you have comments or questions, this would be the time, and then I would ask for a motion simply to receive the report. Yeah, so I just want to thank administration after our comment last time regarding sccfreevax.org that now has been able to point to the most current pages, so thanks for the quick uh, fix and make that work. Um, 
Also, uh, we, I saw that there was an article published on Times suggesting the latest vaccine seems to be doing a great uh, job warding off the emerging variants. Um, is that also uh, the data or information we are looking at on Vivian Santa Clara County as well? Yes, thank you, Supervisor. We are seeing both the general um, data coming out of studies of the vaccine that they continue to be very well matched to the latest emerging variants nationally, uh, in particular the JN.1 variant. And those are the same variants that we are seeing here in Santa Clara County. So we continue to have good evidence that the latest vaccine is well matched to what's circulating here locally. Thank you. If that's the case, I would like to see if we could also you know, publish that information on our website for people to read themselves and they could do their own research and find uh, uh, competitive status. Okay, and that's all I have, and I'm ready to uh, move to uh, receive this report. Thank you. All right, then. We have a motion by Lee and a second by Simidian, Madam Clerk, on item number four, simply to receive the report, which is the only recommended action. Please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you very much. The motion passes unanimously. That takes us to item number five, uh, where we receive a report from the Public Health Department relating to public health risks of artificial turf. Dr. Redman. Thank you again. Um, well, so I want to offer my thanks to uh, Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Vice Chair, for raising this important issue in this body. Um, I think as we've delved deeper here on the behalf of the Public Health Department, we've understood how this is the considerations about the potential public health concerns around artificial church are a complex issue. Uh, it crosses a lot of disciplines in both human health and environmental science. Um, and so in response to the initial inquiry by uh, Supervisor Simidian, I think now two months ago, public health provider just a very general overview about last month laying out the major categories of threats for consideration uh, and focusing on areas where there are proven impacts to uh, human health in particular. Um, now, fortunately, I recognize we have several partner organizations here in Santa Clara County who are deeply knowledgeable about this topic. And so I think in addition to the overview of information we've provided, there's a lot more out there for consideration. And I want to acknowledge that any individual decision about when and where to uh, possibly utilize artificial turf or make other decisions about other landscaping um, is a complex decision and one that may take not only health and environmental considerations, but other operational ones into, uh, into consideration. Um, so with that complexity, I'll forego any formal presentation on those risks, um, submit our written report, but also bring before you two of my colleagues from the public health department. I have Dr. Krishna Sarasi, who is an assistant public health officer and a physician with expertise in environmental and occupational medicine, and Dr. Marilyn Underwood, our director of environmental health. Uh, and we're happy to focus our time today on the questions of greatest interest to the health and hospital committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sue Rajali, we do have two cards from folks who are here uh, to speak. Appreciate the doctors all being here as resources. Um, let me check with the clerk, see what we have online, if anything. I have six online. Hmm. Okay. Then uh, I believe pursuant to the rules, when we have uh, eight speakers, we typically go with one minute. Is that correct in committee or am I remembering correct? Two minutes? Let me. Two. In committee, it could be one. Okay. It's up to the chair. Let's check with the county council, who's squinting even as I speak. <laughs> Looks like it's two minutes. All right, two minutes it is then. Uh, that's great. It's only when we get up to a larger number that it's one minute. All right. I will ask uh, all of the speakers to be concise if they possibly can, just in recognition of the fact that we have a long agenda today. So in the chambers, uh, we have Susan Hinton to be followed by Courtney Jansen. Come right up to the microphone, please. And then we will go to... Uh, the folks who are online, and we will uh, establish the queue after the first person has spoken. So if you are uh, online and listening, and forgive me, this is a slight change from previous instruction. Um, if you're online listening, uh, after we hear from these first two speakers in chambers, uh, if you want to speak, you need to have your hand raised when we start the queue. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, good afternoon. I'm Susan Hinton, and I'm Ms. Chair Hinton, I apologize, but... I'm gonna ask the clerk to turn the volume up a little bit so we can hear you. Go right ahead. Um, You're good. 
I'm Susan Hinton, and I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Loma Prieta Chapter's Plastic Pollution Prevention Team. In November, I wrote a letter to the Board of Supervisors intended for this committee. The Public Health Department report you received today on harms of artificial turf is based on an out-of-date summary. It cites information from 2018 or earlier, and three-fifths of the information is from a single outdated source. In the past five years, many more scientific research articles have been published. These studies and research confirm that heat stress is an increasing concern due to warmer temperatures. Injury on artificial turf fields is greater and more severe than on grass. And especially, there is chemical exposure from PFAS chemicals the EPA wants removed from the nation's drinking water. Um, current research states that microplastics, such as those that break off from artificial turf, can affect the human body by stimulating the release of endocrine disruptors. These endocrines produce hormones for growth, fertility, and reproduction. Current research states that um, oh, yesterday, the California Coastal Commission rejected UCSB's request to replace a three-acre field with artificial turf. Instead, they approved replacing the field with natural grass, more natural grass. Um, staff stated, the concerns relate to the potential impacts of the proposed artificial turf, including plastic degradation, microplastic migration, chemical leaching, water quality impacts, and project-related water demand and sustainability aspects, among others. I urge the Health and Hospital Committee to look at recent peer review. Thank you. And that means we go next to Courtney Jansen. Uh, can I turn this in? Please do. Thank you. The clerk will take it, and she'll make sure that not only these uh, committee members get it, but that the entire board gets it. Thank you. Courtney Jansen, you are up. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Courtney Jansen, and I'm a resident of Sunnyvale. I, too, am concerned that the public health risks of artificial turf report heavily underplayed the health, safety, and environmental concerns of artificial turf and ignored substantial amounts of new research that supports that artificial turf is unhealthy. But today I'm going to focus just on some health and safety issues given the topic of this committee. First, it is well documented that artificial fields are substantially hotter than grass, often more than 70 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, especially on warm days, which we have a lot of here. This means an increased risk of heat stroke to anyone playing on an artificial turf field. Second, the plastic blades are rougher than grass, so when players fall down, which they will do, they are more likely to get turf burn. Third, artificial surfaces are harder than grass. This means that when people fall, there is an increased risk of uh, getting a concussion. Finally, artificial turf is made of many nasty things, including things like PFAS chemicals. To be clear, there is no such thing as PFAS-free artificial turf. Even the artificial turf industry admits this when pressured. And even if there were no PFAS in the infill, the infill contains things like lead, zinc, and black carbon. And regardless of what the infill contains, the plastic blades will also and always contain PFAS chemicals. Those PFAS chemicals are linked to increased risks of numerous health concerns, including an increased risk of certain types of cancer, decreased immune system efficiency, and reproductive health issues. Even more health issues are being connected to PFAS chemicals every day. For the sake of the health and safety of everyone in Santa Clara County, I urge you to keep artificial turf out of Santa Clara County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And let's go to the folks on uh, Zoom. And how many do we have now in the queue where we're going to say that's the queue? We are holding at six. Thank Our you. first speaker is Pamela Bond. Pamela, we've asked you to unmute. Go right ahead, folks. Hi. Thank you for requesting the off agenda report on artificial turf health concerns. With the earthquakes finalizing a deal with the county and San Jose to build a sports complex, including four artificial turf fields, and likely more sports complex plans to come in the county, this is an urgent issue. Three organizations, 10 Strands, Undaunted K-12, and the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation are embarking on a partnership to push for heat resi resilient schools. And they're trying to revive Senate Bill 394, which had almost unanimous congressional support. Their argument for investing in heat resilient schools now is that the cost of inaction will be greater. 
We need temperature limit recommendations and safer outdoor environments for play. I witnessed about one third of a high school field being dumped on agricultural land in San, San Jose, sorry, artificial turf field. On Facebook, marketplace sellers are advertising used sports turf for sale, still full of crumb rubber infill with pickup locations in our county, as well as in pescad places like Pescadero. Natural grass sports fields, engineered wood, and other materials are much safer options for children's play spaces. I hope that the county supervisors can take this into account when approving projects in the county and seriously consider any projects involving artificial turf and plastic and rubber products in light of both current and quickly evolving research. Please consider a ban on artificial turf in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Fan. Please unmute. Good afternoon, Cynthia Fan, county resident. Uh, yesterday on the My apologies, I accidentally muted you. Please unmute. Ready? Yes, sorry about that. No problem. Good afternoon, Cynthia Fan, county resident. Yesterday on the basis of environmental concern, a state agency known as the California Coastal Commission denied an applicant the option to install plastic turf. I would like our county also to deny landowners this option. Existing efforts to simply discourage its use are commendable, but insufficient. For environmental and public health, I urge you to institute a countywide ban on both installation and outdoor storage of plastic turf on both private and public land, including the county fairgrounds. With the recent passage of SB 676, the city of Millbrae has set a precedent with their ban. We can adapt their language for our needs. As we replace living landscapes with plastic under the guise of water conservation, we must acknowledge the broader consequences. Plastic turf hampers our land's ability to sequester carbon, clean the air and water, cool communities, recharge groundwater, and reduce flood risk. All of this puts our collective future public health at risk. We need to prioritize resilient living landscapes with trees, native plants, and for recreation, organically managed, drought-tolerant natural turf. Plastic turf's negative impacts extend throughout its life cycle from extraction of resources to disposal, inequitably harming already disadvantaged communities, as well as potentially contaminating food and water supplies along the way. To permit artificial turf is inconsistent with the county's goals for climate resilience, environmental justice, environmental sustainability, zero waste, and public health. We need this ban to safeguard our environment, air, water, soil, and food supply, and in turn, our people. Let's make Santa Clara County a model for the state. Please ban plastic turf. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leanne McAuliffe. Please unmute. I am requesting that Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors in line with recently acquired Leanne, are you still there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I am requesting that the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, in line with recently acquired power given by the passing of Senate Bill 499, ban artificial turf on all grounds under their control. This is essential because time and again, the artificial turf industry, whose ultimate goal is growth and profit, are using their misleading marketing to get sales whilst consumers are totally unaware of the negative impacts of this heat-generating, polluting plastic product. To circumvent this, there simply needs to be a ban on this product. We know PFAS are in plastic turf as industry representatives are fighting against legislation to regulate PFAS and artificial turf. From manufacturer through use and disposal, artificial turf provides a direct pathway for these forever chemicals, among other pollutants, to contaminate our land, air, water, and subsequently wildlife, aquatic life, and humans. No filters extract PFAS from plastic field runoff, but one important and undesirable filter is being overlooked, the users, those people, increasingly children, that are using these fields. This is important because K-12 to age children are our most vulnerable population. Also, artificial turf is synonymous with the term heat island, and it's questionable whether it saves water at all. The manufacturing of one square metre alone takes 989 gallons, which could water real grass for several years. 
never mind the water needed for cooling, cleaning and chemical recycling. On the other hand, natural turf, though it also requires water, is sustainable and feasible and comes with many other benefits like oxygenation, evapotranspiration, which cools, filtration, carbon sequestration, which plastic turf will never be able to replicate. Please ban artificial turf and set a precedent for other counties. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, please unmute. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I think considering that soccer is probably one of the most prominent sports in the world, and especially for the Mexicano and the Latino communities, um, their kids are going to be playing on soccer fields. Um, I don't trust uh, manufacturers. I, I just, I don't trust them at all. I trust them about as much as I do my government. Th there needs to be checks. And, 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 and more checks and more checks because sometimes the symptoms of what it is that these types of products, uh, they don't surface for a generation or two. By that time, the people that created the product are long gone and really honestly, they don't care. They really don't care. And, and that's cool, I don't blame them. They're selling the product, that's their hustle. Get your hustle on them, but what your job is, is to protect the community. That's your function. The common welfare that it was, uh, that was installed, that common welfare in the Declaration of Independence is a normal functioning, uh, is a normal function of government. And so I would ask that that principle be applied within the context of this conversation in order to ensure that uh, children, uh, especially from my community, Latino kids and Chicanos and Mexicanos from the east side of San Juan, that they're protected and that they can count on their county, their, they can count on their county government to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrea Wald. Andrea, please unmute. Hello there. My name is Andrea Wald. I'm a longtime Santa Clara County resident and member of a newly formed group called Community for Natural Place Surfaces. Our mission is to educate the public on the ills of artificial turf and have it banned. We've been successful in the city of Sunnyvale regarding an upgrade to a natural grass field rather than to artificial turf in one of our, uh, in one local park. And now we're focusing on Santa Clara County Fairgrounds Sports Complex, as well as several other locations. I've already sent an email on December 8th pointing out reasons for your committee to veto installations of AT everywhere in Santa Clara County. The heat island effect on our environment makes global warming worse and loose plastic blades and bits pollute our drinking water. It causes irreparable damage by harming humans and wildlife. It will lead to devastating illnesses we are only starting to categorize. Once artificial turf is installed, the cost to go back to natural grass may be substantial. Why not start with natural grass instead? It is so much better for the environment and for the health and safety of all. Proper grasses and irrigation systems, especially with reclaimed water, will make maintenance simpler and less expensive. Groundskeepers who are educated on organic pest pesticide-free field management can, can advise you on how best to proceed. I hope you will dig deeply into current research regarding artificial turf and understand that this plastic is being pushed by the petrochemical industry and is not anything society needs. Thank you. Thank you, and our final speaker on this item is John McKenna. John, please unmute. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson and Board Members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I want to thank the previous speakers for their excellent and powerful comments on this important and often misunderstood topic. Uh, my name is John McKenna, and I am the father of a nine-year-old daughter. I'm speaking today about the harms of plastic turf, both to public and environmental health. As is often the case, there are trade-offs to consider. However, in the case of plastic turf, the harms far outweigh the benefits, and there are better natural solutions. On a warming planet, heat waves are becoming more common and more intense. Temperatures on plastic turf have been shown to increase 55 degrees higher than natural grass reaching nearly 200 degrees Fahrenheit on a summer day. This is not a safe environment for our children. Moreover, the environmental impacts are equally negative. 
The manufacturing of plastic turf involves the extraction and processing of fossil fuels, which contributes to global warming. The product contains microplastics and PFAS, which find their way into the food chain, affecting all forms of biodiversity. And at the end of the turf's useful life, it most often ends up in a landfill, creating more waste on a planet that is being overrun by plastic pollution. For the benefit of our children and our planet, please take the necessary actions in order to end the practice of installing plastic turf in favor of new types of natural grass that are hardy, drought tolerant, and low maintenance. Thank you for your consideration and for your service to the community. And that is our last speaker, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Thank you. Then the matter is back before our, our committee, forgive me. Uh, Supervisor Lee, uh, what I wanted to suggest in response to Dr. Redmond's comments was that we ask for, uh, and I am sure folks here and others as well can be part of this, um, uh, we ask for a, what I'll call a follow-up uh, uh, report back to our committee uh, with an off-agenda report uh, in April, and I'm deliberately picking a time that is 90 days, at least 90 days, uh, as we've discussed from time to time, to make sure that we can get a more robust response. Let me begin by asking Dr. Rudman and the county executive if that timeline works. Yes. And part, part of what I would say, and Dr. Rudman, you alluded to this, I think the initial um, report back was um, designed to get a report back as quickly as possible, which is what we had asked for. Thank you, I appreciate that. I thought um, while there was uh, a start on environmental issues that there were, um, there was not as much as I hope to learn about uh, what I'll call the public health impacts or potential public health impacts. So I would simply call that out, raise that up uh, as something that a subsequent report would, would look at. And let me ask you both before I turn to Supervisor Lee here in a minute, um, are, are there other, and then I'm gonna, actually I'm going to go to county council as well, as well as the county council. Um, are there other parts of our organization besides public health who ought to be part of this conversation? I think so. I think we'll uh, probably reach out to the Office of Sustainability and ask them to you know, add uh, their perspective and you know, we'll give some thought to if there's other, other parts of the organization as well. Okay, and then, um, just so the speakers and members of the public understand, looking to Mr. Press and or the county executive, uh, in terms of what we have the authority to do as a board of supervisors, uh, unlike uh, certain other circumstances, I, I wanna uh, make sure my assumption's a correct one that we do not, underline not, have the authority to tell the 15 cities and towns what they can or should permit uh, uh, in, the, within their 15 incorporated cities and towns. Is that I'm going to have to research that question right. for you. Well, then, good, because uh, we're going to get asked that question again and again. Uh, and um, I will ask for that additional information. Uh, for members of the public interested in the issue, uh, regardless of point of view, that's where 95% of the county's population is, is inside the incorporated 15 cities and towns. So, um, you know, it will be helpful and important to hear back. Uh, Mr. Press, I don't, I don't think we need to wait till April for that information. Is that something we could get sooner rather than later? Absolutely. And is that something, I know typically it's your judgment to share uh, legal advice with our board in a confidential uh, environment, but again, I'm, part of the reason I'm asking is so people know what venue to go to to get what result they want. Can we get that in a way that is public? Yes. All right. Can we do that off agenda, please? Just because I uh, I want to facilitate that as uh, at the earliest opportunity, and um, I think uh, as I said, if there's a motion to uh, report back in April with a um, an updated and supplemented report, supplemental report, uh, and uh, to request a legal opinion on uh, the board's authority within the 15 cities and uh, towns. That would be uh, well received by me, Supervisor Lee. What's your take? <clears throat> yes, I uh, <clears throat> certainly agree <clears throat> with that uh, proposal. Um, so I would make that motion. Um, and I would also like to add on to it is uh, it would be very helpful to um, 
in that report to add the number of counties and cities that have taken uh, this issue and uh, or, or putting a ban on the usage of these artificial turf, uh, just for us to have reference as to how many other jurisdictions is taking on this issue, uh, and also about the uh, the law that was signed by the, the legislature recently, uh, allowing the local government to ban the artificial grass. So those are information I think would be great to come back uh, during April, if possible. Thank you. I'm going to call that a motion, and I'm going to second it, Madam Clerk. Okay, and. Uh, Anything else, Supervisor Lee, or can we call the question, although I'm looking down at Mr. Press. Mr. Press, your light is still on. Your light is now off. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Sumidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thanks again to folks who came to speak, and thank you, Dr. Redmond, to you and your team uh, for being here. And even though we didn't uh, pull them into the conversation, I'm very pleased and appreciative of the fact that you're here to hear the conversation and comments from community. All right, thanks. It takes us to item number six. Uh, we do have the report. Is there a presentation here or should we go straight to uh, public comment, if any? There is not a presentation, uh, but again, I have, I have brought in the people responsible for the important work before you. So I will just note that um, I'm joined by Beverly White Macklin, who is the program manager three leading our um, black infant health program and a long time, champ long time champion of services for African and African ancestry communities in Santa Clara County. So her team is here today uh, is responsible for the important work described in the report and the report itself. And we are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first see if we have cards on this item. Do we have any speakers here in chambers? No speakers in chambers. Okay, do we have any speakers on Zoom? One speaker on Zoom. All right, then uh, if there's no objection, and uh, let's take that speaker on Zoom, uh, and then uh, we'll bring it to our committee. Thank you, Paul Soto, please accept the unmute. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. There was, a, there was another uh, population, uh, something about black children, within this particular item. I, I don't know if that was like the like the color, like the actual color black, or if it meant people of the black community. So I don't know which is which. And so that's the problem with using color is because when you're talking about a color, I'm not brown and blacks, they're not black. We're only black and brown when compared to a white supremacist centered perspective. Then we have color. But it's only from that perspective because blacks are Africanos. That's who they are. And I'm not brown, I'm a Chicano. And so there's confusion here. Um, but I'll assume that you meant black children and not the name of uh, something else. And we need to have, if it meant black children, there needs to be some kind of information that is going to inform the position of the county within the context of the meeting on the record and not just reading the document. Certain things need to be said publicly on the record for posterity and to align with what the county states rhetorically is that it respects and understands that racial inequity and racist policies have had a detrimental, literally a genocidal impact on the Chicano community, the Mexican community, and the African American community. And do we have any other speakers, Madam Clerk? No, that concludes our public speakers. All right. Supervisor Lee, comments, questions? We have a lot of folks here who are knowledgeable on this topic. Thank you all. Thank just, you, yeah. Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Um I would like to introduce my colleagues, um, Grace Mary Galano, and she's the Director of Nursing and Maternal Child and Family Health Branch Director for Public Health Department and Shilpa Jalsi. She is the program manager for our perinatal equity program. In May 
2021, the Board of Supervisors approved a referral at the request of then Vice President Ellingberg to expand the county's BIH and PIEI programs with a proposed budget of $821,818. The report that we are presenting today um, relates to the work plan update for this program. Um, and for the expansion of, uh, of work to improve the lives of African-American and African ancestry, parents and babies in partnership with local hospitals, health system leaders, and the African, African ancestry community. As we know in Santa Clara County and throughout the nation, there are significant disparities in maternal and infant health outcomes among African and African ancestry families. These mothers experience the highest rate of maternal death and pregnancy complications. African American mothers, African ancestry mothers are more likely to have cesarean sections rather than a normal birth and their infants are born smaller and sicker, which can lead to a lifetime of implications for their health and wellness. The BIAH and PEI programs address these disparities at the individual, community, and systemic levels. Some examples of how these two programs address the disparities that are detailed in our submitted report include the following. At an individual level, we have partnerships with the Roots Community Health Center and Ujima Adult Family Services to provide doula, lactation, and behavioral health services. At the community level, we have used social media platforms addressing and bringing awareness about racial disparities in birth outcomes for black birthing people with a focus on the root causes and disparities of these disparities, including structural racism and bias. Systemically, we are working with local hospitals within the county to promote health equity within their organizations by conducting health equity policy reviews and providing feedback on the action items. The funding approved by the Board of Supervisors has allowed the BIH and PEI programs to expand and to have focused and on dedicated work through evidence-based actions so that African-American, African ancestry, parents and babies can have further healthier lives. Black mothers and babies and families also deserve to be healthy, safe, and supported. There is much that has been accomplished, but still more has to be done. Sustaining the current level of investment will ensure that our medical system is equipped to provide equitable health care to improve the health outcomes of African, African ancestry birthing families. We are open to any questions or comments regarding the submitted report at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, addition to our written report, Supervisor Lee, questions or comments? Yes, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for this report. And it is very clear that there's a real, <clears throat> real dedication and care going to this program and all the ones. So we'd like to acknowledge the work you're doing uh, to work with the local organizations that are representative of the people that we're focusing on serving. I also would like to uh, stress one point in terms of hiring. Uh, that staffing black women in black maternity health programs is absolutely crucial and potentially life-saving. It fosters a culturally competent healthcare environment and helps build trust and comfort for black patients, whom we may feel much more understood and supported by healthcare professionals who share similar backgrounds and lived experiences. This can lead to not only improved communication, better patient engagement, and more personalized care. Uh, looking at some of the really troubling data, the infant mortality rate in the United States uh, for black infants is more than twice of white infants. And this is actually numbers recently, and it's worse than the number that we see in the 60s. Um, 
and and there's uh, actual studies uh, being made uh, last couple of years to show that uh, the doctor's rates become an issue uh, on the, the black newborn survival. So because of that, I really think this is such a big issue uh, that you're addressing. And so as we move forward, I really hope that some of these key hires can be reflective of the population that we are trying to serve here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, would you like to uh, simply offer a motion to receive the report then? Absolutely, so moved. Well, then we'll say thank you. I will second the motion. We had no speakers uh, other than the one we took. And so we will now call the roll, please. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Thank you all again, and thank you for the work. Happy holidays. To you. All right, that takes us to, I believe, item number nine, Madam Clerk, just to make sure that the other items were properly placed on consent. That is correct. All right, and do we have a report on this in addition to uh, the written report that we have? I think we have uh, a, yeah, a presentation, Simeon. yes. We do have a presentation. Um, with your direction, we can move right to, to questions, if you please. Uh, I, here's what I'm going to say. We do have a hard stop today at 5 o'clock with a long agenda. We've put some items on consent. Supervisor Lee, I know uh, this item is here in significant part because of your interest and request. So I want to make sure we don't uh, uh, do anything to curtail that. So why don't I defer to you and see what you'd like to do in the way of a presentation and also defer to you on comments and questions to begin. What's your preference, sir? Yeah, we, I've seen the report, so I don't think we need to go through it right now. And, and the, uh, I do have a couple of questions and comments, and maybe I just dive right into it, if that's okay with you, Chair. Thank you. Go right ahead, uh, Supervisor Lee. Sure. So thank you so much uh, for the report. And although the report suggests that SCVH is doing well with the CRC screening relative to other health systems of the state, staff also uh, no notified us that uh, when we're touring the Center for Digestive and Liver Health Clinic, that we need to improve CRC screening rates since it's so preventable, yet we are struggling with patients following through with the FIT test through the mail. Uh, speaking of my staff, the administration has highlighted ways to improve the CRC screening, including community-wide education planning efforts, leveraging partnerships, and reaching out to at-risk patients directly. Can you please provide some details about these efforts? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee, and um, thank you for having us uh, speak about this topic. I'm accompanied today by Sonia Menzies, who is the Executive Director of Ambulatory and Community Health Services. Um, so in addition to the um, uh, measures that you mentioned, another innovation that we've instituted in our colorectal cancer screening program is the idea of in-reach. And uh, we find that outreach is a wonderful tool when we contact patients, we talk to them about colon cancer screening, but many times when people get fit cards in the mail, they may or may not pay attention to them. And so we have our population health coordinators um, talk to patients when they come to clinic for any reason. So they're in the primary care doctor for a blood pressure check or their diabetes. Uh, we use that opportunity as well to address uh, the possible um, uh, you know, methods of colon cancer screening and to increase that as well. Um, I'm pleased to say that our return rate of fit tests is around 65%, which oh, you look at it one way and you say, okay, one third are not being returned, but that compares to national averages that are in the 25 to 30% range. So we're doing really quite well. And I believe the reason for that is, as you alluded to, having a human to human contact, um, in addition to just sending out a mailer or a card is absolutely essential when dealing with something as important as colon cancer screening. Well, <clears throat> great, yeah, so I, this is certainly good news that we're doing such a good work. Um, and so I would just uh, move to accept the report as a motion and like to ask for a follow-up report to our committee here, say in six months, uh, on efforts towards improving the FIT test through our community-wide education planning efforts and leveraging partnerships, if that's uh, doable. Absolutely, thank great. you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we have a motion by Lee with a request for a follow-up uh, report back to our committee, if I may, uh, by May or June. Is that uh, that's agreeable? Correct, yes. Uh, and we'll work with your staff and committee staff to see uh, what works best. Uh, and I will second the motion. Do we have any cards on this? I'm going to ask one, one last we time. We do not. All right. Then let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for your work, and we'll hear back from you as you make even more progress. Appreciate it. All right. That takes us to item number... 
10. Uh, and uh, do we have a report on this in addition to our written report? Ms. Tarrao? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Sherry Tarrao, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, we don't have a formal presentation. Um, however, we do have staff available um, if there are any questions. All right. I thought this might be a candidate for consent, but I know, Supervisor Lee, you had some questions or comments you wanted to offer, so now's the time. I'm turning to you, sir. Yes, I'll jump right in. Thank you, Sherry. Um, based on the report, I understand that the IFSP and the ACT level clients need more coordination discharge planning, leading to timely access issues. Supervisor Lee, forgive me. I'm going to ask the, uh, forgive me for oh, the interruption. I'm going to ask you to speak up a little. I'm going to ask the clerk to raise the volume a little, and I'm hoping that will reduce the number of furrowed brows I see from people who can't hear. Okay, go right ahead, sir. All right, thank you. Let me try again. So based on the report, I understand that the IFSP and ACT level clients need more coordination discharge planning leading to timely access issues ranging from 15 to 22 days. Um, so while the state standard is supposedly within 10 business states, uh, what would you say would be things that we need to improve on? Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Um, I think uh, just a couple of things I wanted to say is, number one, I think for our intensive outpatient programs, um, it's actually difficult to put them under that 10-day timely access just because of all the intensive coordination that needs to happen. Um, of, uh, more than 90% of the clients that are kind of referred to these programs come from um, IMDs or inpatient. And so there's ex extra coordination that needs to happen um, with uh, inpatient hospital setting with our 24-hour care um, team as well as our ACT providers. Um, having said that, though, we are still uh, regularly meeting with our um, other mentioned parties to continue to really kind of talk about how can we coordinate better, how can we share information uh, sooner than later, just so that the time that we have currently can be reduced. So we're still working on that. Um, another thing that was mentioned with the staff is that sometimes the uh, information that gets um, the referral form that gets um, sent to our provider doesn't necessarily have all the information that's needed for them to outreach to them. And as you know, many of our um, clients with high acuity are also resistant to services, you know, and so we're really working on um, continually outreaching and engaging with them so that they uh, are voluntarily and actively wanting to participate in the program. So we're trying various different angles to try to reduce that um, timely access, um, but it, it has been challenging. So since <clears throat> this is a state standard, right, obviously it's, it's, it's difficult to meet as you have mentioned. <clears throat> I would just like to ask, since we are continuing to improve and uh, uh, improve these coordination, uh, see if this you could come back to us, say, by March. Is it possible to just give us a report as to see whether we have been able to make some improvement based on these new practices you're putting in, in place, and hopefully we could uh, keep working on this issue, if that's well, okay. Well, do. Thank okay, you. great. And uh, I'll put in the motion as well. Uh, if I just say important to incorporate these comments. Second uh, the item I see is that there's some reduction in service hours by 12% at the Navias Clinic and 19% at the South County Clinic due to the staff challenges, right? Staff leaving and reducing referrals through the Cali uh, universal screening tool. So I'm, I'm trying to find out what um, what we need to do to to help um, stop this bleeding, right, and, and, and how best we could uh, get back to the uh, to these uh, type of uh, numbers because certainly the need is not gone, the need is still there. What, what do we need to do at this point moving forward? Good afternoon, Supervisor Lee. Uh, Margaret Obola, Director of Adult and Older Adult Services. Um, in terms of the Navias and South County, we already are putting things in place and uh, through our WET program with MHSA as well as um, loan forgiveness, um, we are able to continue to um, hire individuals mm -hmm. and also uh, provide bonuses for those individuals who are coming in, especially the PSW, those in the clinicians. So 
Yeah, we, we, we do have that attrition going on, and it's not just in those two clinics. We do have individuals moving around um, in terms of um, finding jobs elsewhere. And so we've been coordinating uh, ways to um, help you know, sustain our staff and also uh, provide the necessary resources to keep them working there. Okay, so I know that we have these uh, programs that we're trying to uh, entice folks to join us, to work with us, or keep them here. Um, could you come back, like when we're coming back in March, maybe we could also add that onto it to see if the numbers has improved uh, or if additional programs or resources might be needed to uh, make our working with us uh, being more enticing even, if that would be helpful. Is that doable? So, Great. So I'll, in that case, I'll just go ahead and ask that because you know, I really don't want to um, uh, go in too much more on the reduction of service hours issue. I mean, obviously, that's not something we want, uh, but I want to make sure that we'll closely monitor these service hours in the future uh, moving forward and hope that uh, we could, if anything, get back to what it used to be. So, uh, because the need is certainly out there in the community that we have experienced in so many ways. So, uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and make a motion to incorporate all these comments. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to second. And we did. We have one speaker on, on uh, Zoom. Do we have any in the chambers first? No speakers in chambers, one on Zoom. Let's go to that one speaker on Zoom, please. All right, our speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, please unmute. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I would have appreciated that the, um, the people that are in charge of these reports, that you just necessarily anticipate that the public needs to be informed, especially about audits in this time of Cal AIM implementation. Because believe me, I need to know exactly how long it's gonna be taking me because with Cal AIM, I should be able to have access to behavioral health services, detox centers, uh, uh, residential treatment in a very timely manner. Those, those, those markers have been set by state law. And when you do an audit on this, the management of the system, and you come here, and you, it, your role here is to answer to the public. Yes, you inform because the, the county supervisors, they're, they're, they're the people that you answer to, but they, Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Samidian, are merely representations of the people. So you answer to the people. That's me. That's the, the people in the audience. We are the ones that are affected directly by these policies, especially Kellyme, because what Kellyme was designed to do was to amend the historical uh, uh, neglect of my uh, population in health care. Thank you. And what that did is it contributed to the things of health conditions and the challenges that we faced because of those deficiencies. So with all that said, next time, please come back with some information about how you are instituting telling policies within behavioral health system. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes our speakers. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. We turn to staff, say any additional comments, and forgive me the way the timing played out. We didn't give you an opportunity at all just to introduce yourselves, but you did that as we went along, so thank you. Any additional comments? Please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Samidian. Aye. Thank you all very much. And that should take us to item number 12. Chair Sumidian, uh, Michelle Delacaire, our Director of Systems Integration, will give you an update uh, on this report. Thank you. Good afternoon, Michelle Delacaire, Director of System Integration and Transformation for the Health System. Um, before we open for questions, we j I just want to acknowledge the letter sent by Cassie Executive Director uh, Mar Mariko Sayak who rightfully called out our misspelling and poor recognition um, of their work and support of youth and families in the county. 
On behalf of our team, I apologize for the errors and the lack of outreach directly to the team at Cassie, and we will and ha have already been outreaching to them to connect with them for a future. Um, our intent of the report was to reflect that services would not meet the goal of expanding adult services in the West Valley, um, and we clearly missed the mark on that intended um, work, and we uh, thank everybody for their patience in, in, uh, in our error there. Um, regarding the report, you have our written report. Um, Don Taylor from Pacific Clinics is on Zoom for any questions regarding that um, side of the work. And we're here for any other specific questions that might, you might have. Thank you very much. Let me uh, begin by asking if we have any speakers either here in chambers or on uh, Zoom. No speakers in chamber. We do have one on Zoom. Let's go ahead and take that speaker on Zoom, and when they conclude, whoever's in the queue will be uh, in the queue, uh, but uh, that will be the end of uh, hand raising for the queue, okay? All right, Paul Soto, I've asked you to unmute. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, what I'd like to know is where did all of this like need come from in West Valley for all of these types of services that are pretty much um, needed if we used an equity lens in the distribution of resources with respect to healthcare, if we used racial equity, then the allocation of resources would be going to the Chicano and the Mexicano communities. Because for generations, historically, we have experienced the deficiencies within those systems due to racist policies that still have yet to be amended. So while I appreciate that there are people in West Valley and De Anza College area that are experiencing um, uh, health issues because mental health has no, is no respecter of affluence or poverty, there are abilities for people within that area to access resources in order to deal with whatever life challenges they may be facing. My community, however, is reliant upon you in order to do what it is that you said rhetorically, that you need to start using racial equity in order to create policy that amends the historical deficiencies that were created by racist policies, which that means that you had deprived my community for at least the past hundred years of, of quality, accessible health care, because the Chicano movement was predicated upon amending that. And thank God for Sophie Mendoza, Ernestina Garcia, and Confederación de la Raza Unida, because without those organizations, we wouldn't have the East Valley Clinic today. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so where do we go from here? Uh, Supervisor Smitty, thank you for the question. Um, we are going to be working with uh, Don from Pacific Clinics. They do have a location there. And once we establish kind of a patient population for them to see, um, and they have staff to see those folks, we will be able to provide services in that location. Um, I noticed the important caveat, and they have uh, staff to see those patients. Tell us a little bit more about what that means. Please. Um, I'm hoping that Don is on Zoom and may be able to answer that question. Yes, I'm, in, I'm on Zoom. Um, Thanks for the question, Supervisor, and to the committee. So this is Don Taylor, the Regional Executive Director with Pacific Clinics. And uh, the staffing we have right now includes staff that's supporting uh, both CalAIM Cal Enhanced Case Management and Community Supports for both adults and youth, and then um, a number of specialty mental health youth programs that um, includes up to 15 that are launched through one of our West Valley sites. So those, um, if we were to expand to more adult services, we have a number of staff that are already experienced with serving adults. So we would begin adjusting their caseload immediately.
Mr. Lorenz, I see you leaning in. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, of course, one of the items mentioned in the report is as a health system, we have the ability to contract with specific to ensure that any individual in that community has the opportunity to access the care that they need. Um, so everything uh, relative to our PCAP program, uh, Valley Health Plan, and our, and our other coverage programs. So we look forward to partnering with specific clinics um, to ensure that uh, we meet the objective that you've, you've laid out. Thank you. And uh, for any member of staff who's appropriate, um, the question would be, uh, tell, tell us a little bit more, if you can, about uh, the follow-up to uh, the concerns expressed by Cassie. And forgive me, I'm sniveling. It's Arctic in here, so. Yes, it is. It is chilly. Um, uh, I did follow up with uh, Marcio or Marico, Marico. this Marico. morning. Marico, yeah. Um, and we will be continuing our dialogue, especially around um, some of the Calium initiatives and other things that might be more focused in the school-based um, area where they do their uh, focus. They have a focus of work there. Um, and then we will be moving forward to collaborate where, where possible. Thank you. And uh, the next comments are just for staff to understand my perspective. Um, don't need to comment. Feel free if you want. Uh, don't need to agree or disagree. Feel free if you want. Um, I, I brought this referral originally because I thought that the West Valley was an underserved area. And, um, and I'm going to talk just sort of a little practical board organization. When the board voted to redistrict, uh, re redraw the lines for our five supervisorial districts, uh, I became the representative for four of the five West Valley cities, uh, in addition to Western San Jose, but for four of the five so-called West Valley cities, um, uh, over and above the fact that I had previously represented two. Now, I'm going to be very candid with you about how uh, the world works here on the board. On the one hand, so now you know it's me, on the one hand, um, I thought, well, this could be challenging because previously, we had three different supervisors who each had a piece of the West Valley, and that meant if you had a West Valley initiative, you had two folks who were engaged and informed by virtue of the fact they represented part of the West Valley. So, you know, now we're down to two, uh, given the, the redrawing supervisor. Ellenberg, of course, represents Campbell. Um, and, you know, our supervisors are all, you know, interested about the entire county, obviously, but we have a special responsibility to our districts, in my view. So I have taken it on myself uh, to, you know, sort of do a deep dive on a number of issues that are West Valley issues, and this was one of them, just, mm -hmm. just that simple. And it was my assessment that uh, the West Valley was an underserved area. Now, we've had this conversation before at the full board and in committee, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of us have been advocates for our district at one point or another, but, but here's my take. The district I have is more prosperous than the other four districts taken as a whole. Having said that, within that area, there are folks who haven't shared in that prosperity. And they have needs like everybody else, but they don't always have the resources to address those needs. So there may be a smaller number than there are, well, in fact, I'll say it, it is a smaller number than there are in other districts, but it's 100% of their lives. Um, and so that's why I made the referral was because whatever that number of folks is who needs the help and deserves the help and is eligible for the help, I want to make sure they get it. Now, that's hard to do, uh, and I'm not making excuses for anybody. I'm just going to say as a practical matter, it's hard to do in an area that frankly hasn't been given the attention that I think it requires historically. So, you know, we're going to need to work double time, double hard as a county organization to establish relationships, to grow relationships, to understand the needs and the dynamic of these five communities uh, in the West Valley. And, um, you know, I have a sense of urgency about that. At the same time, I have a sense of uh, reality that it's going to take some time. Um, so, uh, 
to use a technical term, I'll be a dog with a bone on this one, uh, and uh, I don't think that's going to surprise any of you. Um, and I'll keep asking you to um, grow the relationships, grow the level of service, find the folks who need our, our service, and make sure they get it. And um, uh, go forth, please, and do good works. So technically, the only, uh, only item on our agenda here is to, quote, receive the report. But I do want to exhort you to grow that uh, network of relationships, even as we work with uh, a particular provider. All right. Supervisor Lee, comments or questions, if any, from you, or simply a motion to receive the report? Yes, certainly a motion to receive the report. I do have uh, some brief comments. Sure. We have uh, a motion to receive. I will second it, and then we'll turn to Supervisor Lee before the vote for comments and questions. Yes, I, I do want to echo your um, apologies to uh, CASI, which stands for Counseling and Support Services for Youth. Um, and and uh, and for the um, <clears throat> for the for the uh, mistakes made in the report and, and how we need to work more uh, and clearly I don't think our, our our county has not really worked with this organization and certainly something that I would like to request administration to explore uh, uh, some type of a, a partnership with case with Cassie uh, in the future to increase mental health access in the West Valley and say return back to our committee here say. Um, uh, Within three months from now, uh, at the next uh, Mental Health for West Valley Residents Report, is this something doable? Yes. Okay, great. And I understand that the report says that the cost and timeline for Los Gatos site expansion are still being determined. Uh, how soon do you think we can see that type of timeline? Uh, Laura Rosas and I are going to be meeting with uh, Don Taylor and team at uh, Pacific Clinics in the coming weeks, and we'll hammer out the details on that. Okay, very good. And that's all I have, and that's my motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Smidian. Aye. All right. Thank you all very much, including those who are out there in the field doing the work, particularly those out there in the field who are doing the work. That takes us to item number... Fourteen. I'm being prompted, and I believe that's consistent with my notes. Madam Clerk, yes? All right. Item number 14. This is about the efforts to establish a uh, West Valley Clinic, a uh, health clinic at the De Anza campus. Who's going to lead on this one? Supervisor Smidian, this is Jeff Draper from the Facilities and Fleet Department. I will take the first question, and it might go somewhere else, but we'll see what you come up with. Thank you. I think uh, the only question is, I know this is literally a kind of a day-by-day-by-day -day -by -day, uh, evolution. And, um, it, you know, I find this all very exciting, uh, which is to say a lot of darn work for you. Uh, and because to my knowledge, as you've progressed, we're not aware of any place else in the state where there is a county health clinic on a community college uh, campus. Am I still accurate in my understanding of what we know or think we know? That's what I believe too, sir. All right. And, um, you know, we we know that because we've got two huge bureaucracies here, both of which have sort of state uh, overlays as well, a county system and a community college system, and then the state of California uh, in the mix as well, that, uh, you know, this is challenging in terms of integrating systems and making uh, the two big organizations work. Are we making progress in that regard in your assessment? I, I, that is my assessment. We're making good progress. Okay. What are we going to hear next, either at this committee or at the board level, that's a little more um, conclusory in its assessment? I know we're in a feasibility period here, but at some point you're going to come back to us and say, time to make a decision about, you know, go or no go. That's correct. I mean, the steps that we're relying on right now is one step is to finish up the geotechnical survey of the site. The district gave us permission to move forward with that this coming weekend. So we expect to get results from that in about the next two or three weeks. That'll be part of the report, and that'll tell us whether there's any significant changes in the foundation or something that we haven't thought of. Uh, then the other piece is the, the college going through its stakeholder process, the college district going through their stakeholder process. They are making uh, progress. Um, I don't know that they're going to finish on the schedule that we were hoping, which was sometime here between now and the end of January. 
but that will also tell us or inform us of whether the site that we're locking in on can be the site. And so those are the steps that are needed to get us through the feasibility study and move on into the next phase. All right, so um, I will just say it has been my sense that we've sort of moved from um, identifying problems to identifying challenges that can and should be overcome. And uh, that may seem a subtle distinction, but I think it's a real one. I, on, a, on an up note, I would add that uh, the college district did give us an in inclination that perhaps the parking situation may be a lot less of a problem in the future going forward. So that was good news on our last meeting. All right. Um, then I have nothing else to except to say, uh, I hope we'll continue to act on this with urgency. Um, we had the benefit in the um, prior conversations of surfacing some of these issues, so I won't revisit them all again here today. Uh, thank you. Um, can we get just a motion to receive the report? So moved. I will second. Any comments from either folks in the chambers or online? No. Thank you very much. Um, any last words, Mr. Draper? No, sir. Looking around. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Stay the course. All right. Uh, that takes us to item number 16, I believe. Thank you, Chair Smidian. Um, Kim Walker, our program director for the SAFE program, is here. I'll turn Ms. Walker, over to welcome. Kim. I believe this is our uh, regular biannual report. Yes. What, what would you like to share with us today? Um, since our last uh, conversation in June, I should start up, say I'm Kim Walker, um, nurse manager of the Adult Adolescent Program. Um, since our last update in June to this committee, a number of things have happened. Um, you have them in the report, but I did want to highlight that we have, in fact, opened our response location in the South County at St. Louis. Uh, we opened that officially in August. We had a soft opening in July. It's gone very well, and everybody involved at St. Louis has been extremely easy to work with and very accommodating. The emergency department has done a tremendous amount of work with us, and it's been um, clear in the way the patients have moved through the system there. Um, other than that, we also um, had, thanks to um, EMS, for the county EMS um, agency, they did also extend the destination policy, so anybody in the county who is being seen um, for strangulation, DV, or sexual assault is brought to one of the three response locations. This is important because it keeps patients directed immediately to the places where we can respond to them most quickly and with the services that are most likely to be of benefit to them, rather than going to an alternate location and having to kind of two-step their way to get to us. So that's been um, a big change, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, am I remembering correctly from uh, my review, which it's been a, uh, a full agenda, uh, that uh, response times are down, which is good? It is, um, thanks in large part to the fact that we have 24-hour on-site coverage, so we have somebody who can immediately leave um, the office to go to the patient rather than waiting for the on-call response, which is within an hour. Thank you. I, you've impressed upon us, or at least, uh, well, you've impressed upon us and me, uh, certainly the uh, fact that sort of having people alone uh, at this particular time is um, something to be avoided if we can make that, that better. So much good. And then, uh, unfortunately, it looks to me like the numbers are, uh, based on the report, are numbers of exams are sort of consistent with last year and, and sort of stay at a higher level. Is that a fair characterization? It is, yes. We continue to move upwards with the numbers of cases that we have. And I ask you this always, and, and I know it's uh, a hard question to answer, and if there really isn't a, um, an informed answer, you'll tell us, but do we have any sense of whether that's because the problem is getting worse or because people are more aware of and inclined to use uh, the service and access the, the service? Uh, most likely both. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Lee? No, I just want to say uh, thanks so much, Ms. Walker, for uh, your good work. Uh, and uh, very excited to hear that St. Louis is now opened and looks like it's operating well. So uh, that's really ex exciting, but please keep us posted if there's any uh, development or any uh, additional resources that might be needed to keep it that way. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let me add my thanks and just verify two things. Progress at VMC in terms of the, the work there going okay. And we got to what we thought was a better place at uh, Stanford Hospital and that, uh, that continues to work as we had hoped and planned, yes? It's going very well. We're doing cases at three locations as we speak and it's going very well. Mm -hmm. Thank that. you very much. All right, let me just confirm uh, cards either here in the room or uh, online speakers. All right, then Ms. Walker, thanks again. I've worked with you and your team uh, for a long time on these issues and um, very tough work. I think it's admirable that people can get up every day and go do it, so thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Lorenz, and thank you, as I say to your colleagues. Uh, we have a motion to receive the report, yes? yes. I will second, let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee? Aye. Chairperson Smidian? Aye, thank you very much. That takes us to item number 17, which is a report back on am ambulance response time remediation plans. Supervisor, if you don't mind, I have been notified that this is a Levine Act. Well, then go right ahead and uh, Allow provide me. the appropriate notice, please. All right. Um, item number 17 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Thank you, and before we proceed, I'll indicate uh, to reiterate that we have been advised that item 17 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on our agenda. So I wanna ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, a term defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And uh, finally, I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff, or for that matter, any member of the public, knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk and uh, folks. And uh, now, let's go to the heart of the matter, please. Uh, Thank you, Chairperson Samidian, John Mills, Deputy County Executive. Um, this report was provided in response to your request at the October Health and Hospital Committee meeting for a remediation plan to address concerns related to data capture and ambulance response times. The staff report included in your packet describes the current challenges as well as the short-term and long-term strategies that the EMS agency and the county's contracted ambulance provider are pursuing to address those challenges and stabilize the EMS system. Global Medical Response, the county's contracted ambulance provider, has prepared a brief presentation for this item. And before I turn it over to them, I'd like to just begin with um, the individual on my right and have the panelists here assembled introduce themselves. And then we'll turn it over to Brian Henriksen, who's GMR's regional director to lead us in the brief presentation. Thank you all. Good afternoon. One more time. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, supervisors. Uh, Wesley Dodd, uh, Deputy County Counsel. Kat Miller, Medical Director, EMS Agency. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect, okay. The light didn't change over here, so I was a bit confused. I'm gonna uh, do some work here to make sure I'm sharing uh, my screen with you all. We have a PowerPoint presentation.
Uh, my name is Brian Henriksen. I'm a regional director with uh, American Medical Response, which is a part of uh, Global Medical Response. And to my right is Mike Rice, who's our Vice President of Operations in California. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for this brief presentation. It will be brief. It's about six slides. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing in partnership with the county on some of the short-term mitigations to the larger uh, global um, healthcare workforce shortages that I know uh, many in the healthcare industry have been faced with. Some of these short-term mitigations are, are listed on your screen, um, and they start with um, our utilization of, of what we refer to as uh, travel paramedics um, in Santa Clara. These paramedics meet all the same criteria that uh, our, our local employed personnel do, um, but we uh, have been successful with using paramedics from around the nation uh, and bringing them in temporarily to fill about uh, eight full-time equivalent positions um, at any given time within Santa Clara. Uh, some other short-term mitigations include uh, partnership with uh, our union, United EMS Workers, to uh, uh, increase overtime that our personnel are working. Uh, we call this overtime mandation uh, in partnership with the union. Uh, our full-time paramedics and EMTs are currently working on average 12 extra hours per week in order to make sure that we're adding ambulance unit hours to the road. We've also made significant improvements to our recruitment and retention efforts sign-on bonuses, and uh, we're proud to say that our most recent agreement with our workforce uh, has the highest uh, wages, compensation, and benefits that we're aware of in the nation for any private ambulance provider. Uh, Santa Clara um, has also partnered with us on uh, allowing us to bring some of our credentialed EMTs from our Alameda County operations over to augment what we call basic life support ambulance. Those, those are ambulances staffed with two EMTs. And we've been able to increase our, our basic life support ambulance hours to approximately 96 hours per day of additional unit hours from what we were seeing just a couple of months ago. And then we've also partnered with one ambulance provider and in discussions with others to uh, bring on additional ambulance uh, unit hours, advanced life support unit hours, those are paramedic staffed units. Um, that first partnership is with a company named Royal Ambulance who just last week started uh, in partnership with us an additional 24 hours of ambulance uh, availability in the EMS system. There are also some long-term mitigations that are important for us to talk about. Uh, certainly, the expansion of paramedic education in Santa Clara County is, is key. Uh, we currently have one educational program for paramedics in the County of Santa Clara, and that one program, Foothill, only offers one class per year. Certainly, the demand for paramedics far exceeds the supply that we currently have through the one school. And uh, as you saw in the county EMS agency's report, there are efforts underway to expand that with Foothill College. AMR has undertaken uh, similar uh, strategies uh, through our National College of Technical Instruction uh, with expanded offerings next door in Santa Cruz County and also Alameda County to augment the number of paramedic classes that are available generally in the area. We've also implemented Earn While You Learn programs to help pay EMTs and, and uh, those that are not yet EMTs to go to school to earn their EMT and paramedic certifications and licensures. And we have a first of its kind, newly approved California apprenticeship program that's starting in 2024, and that's a statewide program that AMR has been working on. Some other keys, I think, to uh, system efficiencies and making sure we're matching the patient's needs with the appropriate resources. Uh, it, it's important to note that not all 911 responses require an advanced life support response, and about uh, j just a little more than a quarter of all 911 calls actually call for an, a basic life support response. And so making sure we're able to appropriately match patients to the resource that they're getting is key. Um, we are actively working with the EMS agency on a non-ambulance transport vehicle for our behavioral pe health patients. And uh, this is particularly key as we see some expansion of the LPS Act in uh, 5150, particularly around gravely disabled, to the extent that we are able to transport people in alternative vehicles that are not ambulances that are needed for 911 response. 
We've also been working on a pilot program for nurse navigation. Um, this takes place at the, at the time of a 911 call to make sure that the patient, um, once they've been determined to be non-acute, is getting routed to the appropriate healthcare facility. Uh, it may not always be appropriate for patients that call 911 to get an ambulance and to go to an emergency department, emergency departments that we know are already overwhelmed. They have long wait times, particularly as we talk about the seasonality of flu and COVID again here this winter. Um, about 50% of the patients that get a referral to um, our nurse navigation services ultimately end up getting transported via, via alternative means to alternative destinations. And this can include the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center clinics, um, behavioral health care service clinics, and uh, Kaiser Medical Offices. There are some other impacts that we've seen here in the system. Uh, we know that not all 911 dispatch centers are triaging 100% of the 911 calls that come through through the medical priority dispatch system uh, to match that appropriate level of care. Um, so that is an area where we would like to continue partner, partnering with the county to improve. Um, there have been delays at hospitals, um, as we're all aware, uh, due to the impacts that they've seen. On average, we're losing about 800 ambulance unit hours per month um, to excessive wait times. That's the equivalent of more than two ambulances per day. It's a total of about 27 hours per day. Um, and then there, there has been a new computer-aided dispatch Excuse the system. interruption. I just want to make sure I'm tracking. Is this, the, is this the same thing as what, I, what is sometimes referred to as wall time? Yeah, it, it referred to as wall time or ambulance patient offload time or APOT. Okay, thank there, you. There's enough, uh, <laughs> many different names, but that is all the same. Thank you. And uh, there is a new computer-aided dispatch system. Um, as we know, the County Communication Center uh, recently modernized uh, their uh, computer-aided dispatch, or CAD, system. Um, and in doing so, there's been some uh, significant interruptions to how EMS dispatching is done and um, what we call system status management, or how our resources are managed in the system. My last slide, a little bit busy, but this is a chart um, that depicts, um, if you look at the green bars, the ambulance unit hours that we um, have placed on the road. And uh, those green bars, our goal is to be around 850 ambulance unit hours per day. Most recently in November, we were at 815. The blue line across this chart represents the system-wide average response time. And I would call out a, a couple of, of pieces here uh, at the beginning of 2022, uh, our, our average response time was where we have typically seen it historically around the eight minute mark. Um, and as we had been impacted by the significant staffing issues, we saw that average response time begin to increase as you would anticipate with less ambulances on the road. Um, our efforts to um, stabilize those unit hours and, and um, all of the efforts that I talked about in both our short-term and long-term mitigations had helped us start to stabilize that average response time and begin to get ambulance units, unit hours back on the road, particularly the partnership with the county recently on the added BLS unit hours, the ability to have a subcontractor come in with additional ALS unit hours is also helping. We are currently on pace um, in the month of December to beat our November mark will be at around 825 unit hours uh, we anticipate even with the holidays. But important for us to, to note when the, the change was made uh, within the computer-aided dispatch system and the impact that that's had in the system. Although we're adding unit hours, there is a significant impact that we are still actively working through um, with that CAD upgrade and the impacts it's had on the system status management. Um, meetings are ongoing and we're working through those issues every day as recently as this morning. I know uh, we have been meeting multiple times a week um, to try to get those systems operating um, as effective, effectively and efficiently as we can. And that's all I have uh, for my presentation. Thank you very much. Let me check with the clerk, see if we have any speakers either here in the chambers or online. I do not. Ever watchful Supervisor Lee has spotted a yellow card in the plastic container.
We have a card from Mr. Sapien. Welcome. Come up. Good afternoon, Robert Sapien, Fire Chief, San Jose Fire Department. Uh, appreciate the report today. Uh, I, I do want to make sure that it's pointed out that as we talk about unit hours um, uh, that are in the streets, that it does not, from my experience, uh, equate to advanced life support unit hours. Uh, many of these hours are basic life support, and it is the first responder <coughs> agencies that are shoring up uh, performance right now through additional transports uh, and paramedics, firefighter paramedics, riding into uh, uh, hospitals uh, on ambulances that are basic life support. Uh, I do think it's also important to note that the mitigations that are in place, or at least being reported today, are very far afield from the original contract and um, requirements um, that were in place in the original agreement. And so first responder agencies are complying with their uh, agreements that were in place over 14, 15 years ago uh, and are responding to calls in a timely manner, delivering advanced life support services as required by those agreements, uh, and this continues on an ongoing basis. So I think uh, in short, what I would like to uh, plead uh, of the committee is that we ensure that first responder agencies are at the table uh, as any solutions are being discussed and that we do recognize that performance agreements are still in place. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sapien. And uh, I realized as I uh, asked you to come on up, I omitted the title, apologies, and I uh, think I gave you a long A instead of a Sapien. So uh, someone whose name gets mispronounced as often as mine does, I should be more attentive. So thank you for that. Um, I will say, um, well, let me check and make sure we don't have anybody else on Zoom that I'm curtailing. No, there are no speakers on Zoom. Thank you very much. Uh, I will say, uh, Chief Sapien and I uh, spent some time together uh, some years ago working on what was then a challenge with San Jose's uh, response from San Jose Fire. Um, these are solvable problems. They're not easy problems, but they are solvable problems. And uh, I don't... Um, I don't suspect that uh, folks from AMR would uh, uh, rebut for a moment the fact that contract standards are simply not being met right now. Fair enough? Fair enough. I, I think that's fair. The staffing shortages um, have, have been significant, um, but we have put every resource we possibly could um, into this uh, performance here locally, uh, a community that we have served for a very long time. Well, thank you, and Ms. Lowther, I, you know, I'm going to pull you into this as well, obviously. Um, I, I do appreciate the fact that when I raised this, people said, yep, it's real, and we've got to come up with strategies, plural, to address uh, the challenge, and I think we have, you have, uh, but of course, um, all of that uh, has to amount to a tangible improvement, a return to standards. Uh, so. Um, What's plan B if this doesn't work? Well, I, th I think that we're confident in our plan. Okay. Th this, is a, this is really a, a number of um, issues combined. Um, the staffing is definitely part of it. Um, you know, COVID had an impact on the staffing. We know that in other uh, parts of the state, um, this plan uh, or, or w plans very much like it have been effective in helping us resolve response time issues impacted by those COVID staffing things. So we have a lot of confidence in the plan. We're already starting to see the, the actual impacts. Mm -hmm. So as Brian talked about, you know, the, the needle is moving very much in the right direction. Um, I think the technical pieces of this, um, when he mentioned the CAD, the computer aided dispatch, that's a much more technical issue that is um, um, probably not the, the root cause of when this whole staffing thing, you know, was created. I think the slide up there that showed that, that increase, that sharp increase in response times, essentially the moment the new CAD was implemented is really a, a separate issue that we're addressing in parallel with, with the staffing shortage. We have a high degree in confidence that if we stay the course on this, on this plan, we're gonna see the improvements necessary. Well, forgive me, thank you, Mr. Rice. As we toggle back and forth between some of these related issues, 
Do we still have 1,700 responses that we haven't been able to sort properly from a data analysis standpoint? Yes, sir, we do. All right. Uh, you know, I know the data is a means to an end, which is to get a good result and keep people safe. But, uh, you know, I do think um, we, we can't, can't fix the problem if we don't, can't see the problem, and we can't see the problem if we don't have reliable data. So um, I want to exhort folks to stay on that as abstract as it may seem uh, or peripheral, because I think it, um, it's hard to have any confidence in any plan of action if we don't know what we're responding to. And then, uh, you know, I would go on to say, um, let me ask Ms. Lowther or Mr. Williams, how often are we scheduled to hear back on, I, I want to keep watching those lines to make sure they're moving in the right direction and at a good clip. So do we, what's our, I, if somebody can refresh my memory, do we have a, a standing request now for monthly report backs? On, this particular, on this particular item? Yeah. I don't believe so, no. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that request. Um, and let me let me just tell you, and I forgive me for the for the history, which was with which was with the first responders, which was was with the city of San Jose several years ago, when I was relatively new to the board. Frankly, um, you know what I what I observed was um, you got to stay on it or it doesn't happen. And uh, if you stay on it, things can things can get better, uh, but. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of denial that goes into, you know, or, gee, that's just the way it is. No. Um, I don't remember if either of you were here when uh, our prior CEO, uh, Jeff Smith, uh, was in the chambers, and I expressed my concern at the time that the liquidated damages were not sufficient to uh, generate performance, and I was told, oh, no, they are. Um, and you know, fair enough to say they can be whatever they are, no matter how high they are. If you can't hire people, you can't hire people. Uh, but I was concerned at the time that I wanted to make sure that the provider, you all, had um, plenty of incentive to deliver per contract. And I, that's a lingering concern. I'll just let it go with that. Last thing is uh, you heard a specific request from uh, the chief to make sure that the first responders were engaged in the conversation about solutions. Thoughts about that and how that might be uh, addressed? Yeah, I, I would offer that that's, that's key in all of this. Um, I think uh, we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about nurse navigation as um, we, we began considering the implementation of that. That was key for us, uh, for the uh, affected jurisdictions. They've, they've been in the room in all of those discussions as we talk about implementation. Um, and uh, we, we are certainly committed, and I've heard from the EMS agency about their commitment around the same. Um, so you, you have that commitment from us. They, they are our partners in response in this system, um, and uh, certainly to be a good partner to both the county and them, uh, we, we, we want to do that. All right, well, as part of any motion, what I'll do is uh, I will uh, ask that we get a monthly off-agenda report similar to the presentation that we got today about wh where we are on these numbers uh, and uh, that'll be a public document and um, we'll put that out there as a request. Also a uh, request and direction uh, to the extent that we can at the committee level to work with the first responders. Um, I think you know, but in case you don't, Supervisor Lee and I just coincidentally um, have experience as local mayors in Sunnyvale and Palo Alto, two places that do things a little bit differently. Uh, but we also represent parts of the county that are served by, you know, what I'll call the sort of core functions of your organization for which our county has responsibility. Um, so uh, let's make sure we have that uh, interaction with the various first responders who, you know, all have slightly different ways of approaching the task. So you got to be sort of sensitive to that, I think. And then let's make sure we have the numbers on a monthly basis so that we can track whether the solutions are or are not working. Because just like I was, you know, determined to get a better result with the first responders in San Jose back in the day, which we did to everybody's credit, um, you know, I'm determined that we get these numbers turned around and 
that the strategies you adopt uh, are smart ones. So, Supervisor Lee, let me turn to you for comments and questions before we get a motion. Yes, thank you. So one of the key issues is staffing and the pipeline. Um, so we talked about Foothill being the only community college in the county that offers program and only have one class, as what you mentioned. Uh, what's the um, bottleneck in terms of adding more classes or making a class bigger so we could accommodate more students? You know, I, I might refer to the colleagues at the EMS agency to answer that um, as they're the regulatory body there. You know, we, we've approached them um, as the, uh, the legacy provider for paramedic education. Uh, we approached it in two ways. We wanted to originally uh, double the cohort to two annually. Um, to do that, uh, they needed a substantial uh, increase in staffing you know, mostly support staffing. So we altered that uh, request to perhaps increasing the, um, uh, the one annual cohort by 30%. That also required um, um, a substantial increase in staffing. Uh, the funding source we were trying to offer to help to do that couldn't support uh, the FTEs they were requesting. Um, so we'll, we'll work with them still. They did, in this particular cohort, by the way, um, accept all their, as they told us, their um, qualified candidates. And as a result, the current cohort is somewhere in the mid to low 30s when it's normally in the uh, mid to high 20s. So this, this cohort has a few more candidates. Um, we are aware of two uh, EMT programs who expressed interest at some point to open a paramedic program. They're still you know, working through their process um, and we haven't been approached by them since. And there is one uh, provider, one program in Monterey County that as they get their uh, accreditations in line, if they are ready and apply to us here for accreditation, we'll certainly engage them. And, and if I may add to that, Supervisor, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, outside of the county, uh, we have done a tremendous amount of work in this area. Uh, we currently have 51 of our currently employed EMTs that are under scholarship agreements with us that are going to both, both Foothill and these programs that are in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and Alameda counties. Uh, those, uh, th those folks are going to finish, you know, this is a long-term fix. It takes about 18 months to get an EMT through paramedic training. Uh, which is why this is taking a little while to stabilize. We've graduated 40 of those folks already that are under contract with us. We have another 51 under contract finishing those scholarships, and then they are going to be working for us for two years full time following their completion of all their paramedic requirements. So that's, that's essentially above and beyond the 30 that we're talking about within the Foothill program. Great, so uh, excuse my ignorance. So how much time does it normally to get to become EMT and then before, before they could go through the uh, paramedic program? It's about 190 hours of uh, didactic training for an EMT. Uh, a paramedic goes through the equivalent of about six to eight months of, of didactic or in classroom training. But that is then followed by a series of internships, uh, a good clinical internships in the hospital, uh, field internships where they have to complete somewhere between 480 and 720 hours of, of internship time on an ambulance with, a, with a, an experienced paramedic. And then they have to go through all the licensure steps and some additional training steps after that. So that's that 18 month window that it really takes our folks to get through. And you talked about the nurse navigators that's able to uh, help uh, by talking to them on the phone. Are we talking about so that they could actually provide um, some type of a solution right off the bat so that th we won't even need to send the ambulance out? Or are we talking about using nurse navigators so that they are not going to the ER and divert them to other locations? Yeah, so um, both. And, and sometimes um, it results in no transport at all. Right. Um, we also utilize, as part of the program, um, you know, partnership with Rideshare to find alternate means of transportation if they need to go to somewhere other than an emergency room. And that alternate means of transportation also can do return trips with stops at the pharmacy to make sure that their prescriptions are filled. So it's sort of this, um, you know, uh, access to appropriate health care and then follow, follow up to make sure that they come back discharged with, you know, the right information, access to their medications and those types of things. Um, mm -hmm. And so this program not only helps kind of in the, in the short term, but we think over time it helps to 
um, provide access to folks who may access primary care through the emergency healthcare system, which is not the ideal way to get it. Um, and you know, so it um, you know, has a big impact. So, um, so this is still, is this still a pilot program at this point? Here, but we do it in a, a number of other areas in the country. Right, so yeah. um, in terms of reduction of the actual transport, how many percent of uh, transport would you say has been reduced by not, uh, not having to send a full ambulance out through this program? Um, I don't know if I could give you an exact percent because we haven't launched just yet. We're still working out all of the, uh, you know, the... the um, oh, no, I mean, because you have other programs elsewhere, you mentioned, yeah. right? So based on those statistics in another location, if we use that to extrapolate how many percent of uh, folks would uh, not need the full-blown ambulance based on those other uh, nurse navigator programs that you have? Um, it really varies by county because it's a pretty customizable... Um, it's a pretty customizable program based on local medical uh, director input on what patients essentially uh, meet the criteria to go into the program. So I think um, we can get you probably a better estimate once we have those um, specifics kind of sorted out here in Santa Clara. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. Uh, we, we, we have seen in other systems, once you have a robust network built up of the clinics and really practice use of this, about a 10% overall um, reduction. Um, so it can be significant, but you're not there on day one, and you're typically not there in year one because it takes time for the system to develop naturally. And, and the, other, the other important piece, I know not to get too much in the weeds here, but um, there's usually a, a, a pretty steep incline um, as the program launches, and then over time, there's a, a little bit of a decrease in utilization because the folks that would typically be more repeat users now have alternate means to access care. So um, that's another kind of important thing to okay. highlight. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, call the roll on a motion to receive the report, Mr. Williams or Ms. Lauser, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not jesting when I say it seems to me my entire time on the Board of Supervisors uh, has been um, <clears throat> in part consumed at least by conversations about the upcoming contract uh, on uh, ambulance. Where are we on the upcoming uh, contract, which, uh, you know, we, if I remember correctly, the prior board adopted back in 2011 uh, a year or two before I even came on the board, and uh, here we are still having the conversation about a new contract. So where are we on this process? We're working on the draft RFP to bring before the board based on the board's prior requests. The RFP will also have to go to the state uh, EMSA for the state's review and approval before it can be released. So those are two processes that need to happen. Approximate timeline, I'm not asking for a commitment here because I know these things as I say, 11 years later, uh, are um, always a little bit hard to nail down. But if we were to give our best estimate of when the RFP would go out and when a response would be uh, received, what, what are we thinking these days if I'm not asking proprietary information questions out here in open well, and public We session? don't know how long the state's review will take, so I think it's hard to predict when an RFP would actually go out. What we, I think, can say is that we're hoping to bring it to the board for board review uh, in the fir first couple months of the new year. Okay, thank you. So there is the, let me try it this way, there is the potential that in the first quarter of the coming year, uh, staff will be before the Board of Supervisors to request authorization for an RFP or an yes. RFQ. Okay. All right, good, thank you, that helps me understand. Um, here again, the motion is simply to receive the report. Motion by Lee, yes. Yes, that's great. Second by Samidian, yes. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Samidian. Aye. Thank you all very much. Thank you to those of you who are here today, and um, let's stay on it, please. And Chief Sapien, thank you as well. All right, that takes us to item number 18, Valley Health Plan Annual Operation Report. Thank you, Chair Simidian. Um, I do have a deck to share. It is quite long, but I can go through it pretty quickly if I can get it to populate. Sure. Okay. 
and Supervisor Lee, I'm anticipating that you might lean forward and say we did get the deck ahead of time. So, um, and Mr. Rosas, I think what I would ask is um, from this wealth of information, what are you hoping our takeaways are? So um, this has been a year of tremendous change at BHP. Um, as you can see, we have implemented EPIC, uh, replacing three systems. We have uh, really focused on improving our quality scores, which we're beginning to see significant change there. Um, we are working on NCQA accreditation and health equity accreditation, both now required by the state of California for Covered California and Medi-Cal. And we have worked to really expand the PCAP program, in both in terms of eligibility and programs. And we are working to improve our outreach and enrollment for Covered California in particular. All right, thank you. So on Tapestry, um, we replaced QNAX, which was our claim system. We process millions of claims a year. Um, ASET was our case management system. And um, we had Valley Express, which was a very antiquated piece of software, and replaced it with Epix, um, which is Tapestry, their, their uh, health plan product. We were one of the first health plans in the United States to do this. And this has given us uh, really robust data analytics, interoperability, secure data messaging and sharing, and um, allows for very effective and efficient workflows. It also supports NCQA accreditation. Um, it pr provides portals for uh, providers and for members, very similar to the My Health portal that the EHR side has for the hospital system. And it allows members, for example, to pull down their own ID cards, uh, do case management, self-referrals, um, ask questions online, as it provides a cost calculator, which is now required by federal law. And um, this will continue to grow in terms of the functionality because Epic is a, a system that continues to evolve and grow and puts a lot of their resources into R&D. Um, these are just an example of the many systems that are worked Ac uh, across the organization to move to EPIC. And it really affected the entire organization. Um, everyone worked really hard this year to make this happen. And we went out live on March 1st, just about on schedule, and um, are now fully on EPIC and have sunset the previous systems and are off the legacy systems at this point. Um, this is an example of what the member portal looks like, where you can ask a question. And this is the provider portal where a provider, for example, can check and see if a claim has been paid and what the status is, among other things. Um, in terms of quality, um, having Epic certainly supports this, but it, quality is a, a broad um, initiative for health plans. NCQA um, owns the HEDIS measures. HEDIS measures um, have about 200 million people across the country. Um, NCQA is the National Committee of, uh, Committee of Quality Assurance. It's the gold standard for accreditation for health plans. And we are required under California law to submit our HEDIS measures to um, across 90 measures in six domains. This year, our HEDIS, um, you have to use a, a certified HEDIS vendor. Our HEDIS vendor actually exited the HEDIS market just as we were implementing EPIC. And so we had to actually do an RFP and bring on a new HEDIS vendor through an RFP process. And we are implementing and about to go live with that, that new vendor, which is Optum. Um, and so that was another implementation simultaneous with the EPIC implementation. Uh, so the HEDIS uh, measures really identify where a health plan is doing well or doing poorly. Um, we are required to submit these measures. Um, we also are required to uh, apply for health equity accreditation this year, which we did. And we, at our exit interview, we had about 100% compliance with health equity. So we anticipate receiving official word within the next few weeks, but we had um, absolutely no deficiencies on health equity. We will file for full plan accreditation as required uh, by 2025, but we will file by mid-2024. And we've already done um, an enormous amount of work just to prepare for that as well. 
in addition to support our quality measures, we, are, we have developed a value-based payment initiative. We've already come to this body before and described that. We launched that in January 1st of 2022. Um, that is for all lines of business, including PCAP. Uh, we incentivize quality through measures focused on preventative services and screenings such as mammograms and um, a, a variety of immunizations and improving access and services. This again um, supports our NCQA accreditation because you have to have a certain level of HEDA scores in order to be considered to be accredited. So we continue to, to implement that and refine that program. Uh, the Community Health Partnership has been our partner in this for, for the um, their members, they are supporting our work through hosting meetings, hosting, um, providing trainings and technical assistance, ensuring that we receive data. And so it's been a really close collaboration um, and we're beginning to really see that improvement come across. And so on these quality outcomes, you can see that we are, our screening and numbers have increased and we have um, much higher compliance. And so we're moving along a, a good trajectory at this point. Um, also, our star ratings for Cover California have improved. This is where is our star ratings in 2022. And this is our star ratings in 2023. So we've gone to four stars in enrollee experience and three stars in the other, in the other rating areas. And then finally, um, because we need to continue to be accredited, our current accreditation is with the Accreditation for Association for Ambulatory Healthcare. Uh, we did receive reaccreditation from this body um, earlier this year, and this is our certificate. Um, next steps on quality to complete our HEDIS vendor implementation. We're implementing VERTA, which is a diabetes reversal program that was recently adopted by the VA, um, and we're really excited about piloting that program. We will continue to build out tapestry to support quality improvement work, case management, and population health, which is a major initiative on the part of the state to really improve um, population health and really use health plans to get there. And we are continuing to partner with the CHP um, and, of course, our Santa Clara Health System to improve HEDIS measures. And we will be expanding that program to more community providers and hospitals. Um, and then finally, um, well, one of our, the last items for this report, the primary care access program, which I know is very important to the Health and Hospital Committee. We did um, increase the eligibility to 650% of FPL. That is baked into the program, and that is, has um, been a very positive, and we're beginning to see an increase in the number of, of folks in PCAP because of that change. Um, as you may remember, we did increase that last year and to align it with the inpatient uh, eligibility program. Um, and this improved alignment it has reduced the administrative complexity and it assures that the patients will receive the right care in the right venue. Um, both nationally and locally, um, behavioral health resources are impacted to an unprecedented degree because of, of COVID really exacerbated a lot of issues and we've talked about that in many different ways at this, at this um, committee. We continue to work on improving providers uh, in, in, in terms of the network. We continue to expand our telehealth uh, capability. And we, have, we launched the ex expansion for behavioral health in 2023. Uh, we currently have uh, 7,500 uh, 7, PCAP members, roughly. This is an increase of about 1,000. So we're definitely seeing an increase. I, I think at the, at the lowest point this year, we were at like 6,400. So we're starting to see an increase. Um, our PCAP goals, as you can see here, we've completed many of these um, and ongoing will be to ensure that people are aware of the program. That's always a challenge for government programs that people are aware that the program exists. Um, so we continue to work there, um, continue to work with the clinics to leverage EPIC data to improve quality and care and continue to outreach to the community. And I have some examples of the, our outreach on, um, on PCAP. And so these are our expansion activities. Uh, we already have members receiving uh, substance use treatment and behavioral health treatment um, through the program now. And so we hope to continue that expansion. Um, this is an example of some of our outreach, our VHP member perspectives. 
Um, we, we are asking people if they know someone who needs coverage. This is to current members, who, but they may have family members or they may have friends who need coverage. And so that's one example of our outreach. We ran this in our last perspective and it's going into the next one as well, which will be out in about a month. And then finally, on outreach, we're working with our county partners on the redetermination, on making phone calls, on making sure people understand uh, various parts of redetermination and, and that when a, if people are moved from Medi-Cal to Covered California, that they will need to sign in and accept that Covered California coverage. Um, we are also working across a number of different languages and making phone calls as well ourselves. Um, because we know this is a, it still continues to be a very large effort. And the other work, of course, is we have covered California open enrollment until January 30th. Currently, we have 3,000 new enrollees already, which is great considering that we are still pretty early in this process. And the state is also encouraging the movement from the bronze plan, which has a significant amount of cost sharing as a member to silver, which is much more... Um, less cost sharing for the member. So we are seeing a lot of that shift over as well, which is wonderful um, because there's a, the, the cost sharing in the bronze plan can be a disincentive to receiving care. And here's another example of our, our outreach for, um, for flu and COVID um, shots through our website. And we're putting a significant amount of information on our website, especially as the county builds out the new site. And um, Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, very comprehensive, as you uh, indicated. And I think the one question I would ask is, um, if I was concerned about quality measures, and I am, what's, what's the path towards continuous improvement there? So again, so with quality measures, it's about the performance of the provider network. And a lot of that comes down to documentation. I'm sorry, a lot of that comes down to? Documentation. So when the provider is seeing the patient and what they're coding for and what they're documenting for, if it's not documented in the record in a way that the HEDIS measure will pull it, it unfortunately will, may not fall into the measure. And so a lot of this work is what we're doing with CHP as well as with VMC and the other hospitals is to make sure that providers are aware of how they're documenting, to make sure that the good work they're doing when they're seeing patients is actually being pulled into the HEDIS measure. That's one aspect. The other is to ensure that patients have access. And that comes down to our case management team. We have a pretty robust case management team at this point since we brought it in-house in 2020. Uh, we have about 30 case managers, including a pretty significant behavioral health case management team. And they will work with providers to help patients get appointments, make sure they're seen, do follow-up. And I think that's the other aspect of this, that you can't have the measures if the patient's not in the office. Let me um, push back just a little on the documentation piece. And, um, and actually, I need to send a compliment to Ms. Lorenz. He was one of the ones who schooled me early on in my tenure on the Board of Supervisors about why documentation mattered and, and that it's not just fussing in forms and all of that, that it really does go to the um, accountability and viability of the organization. That being said, I, I worry a little bit that focusing on documentation becomes a triumph of form over substance, of process over substance. Um, what, what do you think we need to be doing? What do you think we should be doing and can do to make sure that the quality really is there? Because it, it's, it's not just about document. I mean, if I thought it was all good, we just need to document better, okay. But I worry that even when we document what we're doing, there are still areas where improvements can and should be made, and we're missing those opportunities slash necessities. No, it's, it's a really great point, Chair Smidian. So one of the really important aspects of our HEDIS work is gaps in care. 
So we will be, we receive reports from Santa Clara Family Health Plan where a patient, for example, has not had the mammogram when they should have had it or did not have another screening when they should have had it. We will have our, our, both our, our nurses and our case management team, some of whom are nurses, others who are medical social workers, contact patients and try to get them in or work with providers and say, why is this patient not being seen or what's the barrier? So that's another area where it's, it's getting the patient in to be seen and making sure that those gaps in care are closed, which that's a big part of our work at VHP. Got it. Anything else from folks here at the dais? Let me check and see if we have members of the public, either in the chambers or online, who would like to comment. We do not. Let me turn then to Supervisor Lee, see uh, if he has comments or questions on this item. We are on item 18, of course. Yes, thank you so much. Um, one of the uh, things about the documentation that we talked about, um, as we know, it's, it is the medical providers and the doctors and nurses, they, they, they are very good at doing the work. It's the documentation that a lot of times trips things up. And right now, as we know, if you don't fill things properly, very bad things happen. So we could do training, and we've done that. And frankly, that's one, the, the documentation is the part I would say I have not known of any uh, medical practitioner enjoys doing that part. That's the part that everybody hates. It's just the different degree of hate, hatred of it, right? And so I guess my question here is, in order to ensure that the, the amount of errors is minimized, what, have, what could be done in or, order to make sure that these, uh, these new, new forms being filled out, the new data being put in, that we're not gonna keep getting bounce, bounce back? So in other words, is there a way we could actually insert somebody to review these submissions before they actually get sent in so that it could get flagged earlier, uh, early in the process internally for folks who are very good at, you know, filling this form, maybe you maybe give the profession practically to review everybody's submission just to make sure, okay, there's nothing flagging to, to cause problems down the road. Yes, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Otto. So, how do I, um, part of this is having the technology that supports really good documentation and, and clear transmission of data so that the, when, when the form is, a lot of times the, the current technology such as EPIC, which we're not only is most of the county hospitals on, most of the, um, even the CHP clinics are now on EPIC. And that allows when you're transmitting data, it, gets, it, it will flag a mistake before it goes forward. That is one way that we can improve this. But the other way is to do the work that we are doing with the Community Health Partnership, where we actually sit down with the clinics and talk about workflow. Because a lot of it is about workflow. It's about having the patient in front of you, how it, making sure you're going through the list of what, how Epic is providing and that that gets captured and then sent. And there's a lot of workflow issues in healthcare, both on the health plan side and the provider side. It's, and so one of the aspects of when you're implementing a system is to put really good workflow redesign into building that system so that the system is supporting the care instead of making the care harder. The administrative burden that you're referring to is very real. And it has been the focus at both the federal level and the state level for the burnout issue that we're seeing with providers who don't want to be sitting here just you know, entering information into an EHR. They want to do patient care. But by really thinking through the workflows, you can actually deal with that. And so that's some of the work that we're doing with the community health partnership is actually having the providers on these meetings and talking through how um, they can build those better workflows. And Epic has a lot of functionality in that area. We actually just had our quality meeting, which was in person, with a number of providers where we really talked about all the great work they've been doing, because recognition is another piece of this. Everyone's working really hard, and this past year has been so difficult with the utilization. At post-pandemic, everyone wants to go to the doctor and have a lot of procedures done that were put on hold. And so every, recognizing the work they're doing and supporting the good work they're doing is really a big piece of this, which is why we have the value-based payment program. Okay, so um, just 
like, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm glad to see that there are ways that they would flag these issues. Um, but again, I just want to make sure that uh, we, we try to anticipate these type of problems. I mean, look, people make mistakes all the time. I mean, people are busy, you know, people get tired, uh, along with the fact that the system itself is, is hard to navigate, especially when new systems come on board. So I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that uh, whatever resource needed to help folks go through that. And about, like you said, the workflow s situation, until debts move out, you're gonna have kings to work with. And if you don't, mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I just wanna let you know. Uh, and please let us know how, uh, if anything, that this board possibly can do to provide the resources necessary to give, offer additional training, uh, videos or whatever it, it, it is necessary to make sure that this transition is uh, as, as problem free as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee, could you uh, perhaps give us a motion? Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. To receive the report and ask for an off agenda report with a fuller picture of quality measures. I think that would be helpful. Yep, so moved. Mm -hmm. Motion by Lee, second by Sumidian. We're good on public speakers. Still none. Oh, call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Sumidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. And that takes us to our final item, item 19. Let me first ask if we have any speakers on this item, either here in chambers or online. This was uh, Eric Peterson who submitted this item earlier. Mr. Peterson, if you're within the sound of my voice, uh, watching out in the hallway, uh, if you return to chambers, we'll be happy to accommodate your comment. Uh, but uh, for the moment, let's run through the subparts of item number 19. Uh, Supervisor Lee, as you know, the first one is 19A. Uh, anything uh, to report from uh, you, Mr. Lorenz, the Chief Executive Officer of our Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Thank you, Chair Smitty, and I just want to take this opportunity to note that Santa Clara Valley Healthcare has made the 2024 Women's Choice Award for Best Hospitals in the nation, um, and that is an award that is based on 100% objective data, evidence-based quality designations by CMS, <coughs> um, and it is significant um, as women make up more than 90% of the healthcare decisions for themselves and for their family. Uh, so I wanted to uh, note that. Um, a primary care also received an award uh, from the Health and Human Services Agency uh, for being in the top 10% of health centers. Um, and this was uh, noted for uh, their areas of achievement and quality improvement. Um, and also addressing uh, social risk factors in our uh, patient population. So I want to give a shout out to our primary care team and, and the good work. Um, and these awards are given by CMS as noted um, and based on CMS data, which is the gold, sta gold standard relative to healthcare quality data review. And with that being said, I can take any other questions. All right, in the absence of any questions, We'll go to our public health officer and see if there's anything else to report. Only that the public health department submitted the report to describe our collaboration with uh, Asian Americans for Community Involvement, Aki, for the API Community Worker Project. And they're happy to take any questions around it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, behavioral health in the absence of any questions for public health, seeing none. Nothing Mr. else Rao. to add beyond the written report, Supervisor. All right. Thank you. And then uh, we just heard quite a bit about Valley Health Plan, but if there's something that didn't get incorporated there. Thank you, Chair Smidian, and nothing else to report. Still looking to see if there are comments or questions from my colleague as we move along. And uh, Custody Health. Good afternoon, Rosie Luna for Deputy, uh, Deputy County Executive for Custody Health. Today we are providing, a, you have a report just providing an overview of the medication assistant treatment services that we provide. And with me today is Molly Ol Olson, who's the MAT um, Services Program Coordinator here, in case you have any questions uh, on the report today. Thank you. None at this time, or there are, there are in fact questions. Supervisor Lee, thank you. Um, we've been hearing a lot of uh, uptake on respiratory uh, issues. 
recently and throughout the county, uh, I would imagine that would mirror the same within our custody health system. So I just wanted to double check to see how we are doing in terms of getting the flu vaccinations, COVID uh, and, and the like uh, in uh, within our custodial uh, area and just making sure that uh, those are made very much available for those who are ready and willing to take the shot. Supervisor Lee, I don't have the information in front, of, in front of me, but I know that we are actively providing that on an ongoing basis, both the COVID vaccination and flu um, concurrently. It's just part of what we're doing daily, but I can give you um, more detailed information if you'd like on the uptick. Yeah, thank you. I think I think that's a piece of information that needs to be shared. Uh, number one and two is if, if uh, available to also make uh, masks much more available for those who would want one that they should be able to, to get access to that. Thank you. Thank you. And anything else from EMS? Uh, no, sir, you have our report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I think I've made my points earlier today as well, so uh, thank you. Noted. All right, and then that takes us to federal health policy and the budget landscape. Mr. Campos, I see you leaning in. What should we know? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, David Campos, Deputy County Executive. Just want to note a couple of things. First, on the state uh, piece, just so you know that there was a meeting of our state delegation that happened at the VMC campus. So issues involving the health system were addressed, uh, led by our CEO, Mr. Lorenz, and our county executive, as well as President Ellenberg. And then on the federal landscape, we have uh, Bert Margolin, who is on uh, line uh, via Zoom to present a very brief update on where things are at the federal level. Thank you, Mr. Margolin, welcome. Nice yes. To, nice to see you, even virtually. Hey, thanks very much, happy to be here with you uh, virtually. Um, let me start by pointing out that the Congress is moving towards a holiday recess with almost all of the major issues it needs to uh, deal with um, unresolved. Um, the House, in fact, went home uh, earlier today for a three-week recess. The Senate made a last-minute decision to stay in town. I mean, I think they'll go home for the weekend, but they're going to come back next week to deal with one of the major issues, and I'll talk about that more in a, in a moment. The two major sets of issues that, that Congress has to deal with is, number one, the supplemental appropriation to fund Israel and Ukraine, and number two is the 2024 budget. Uh, we have a continuing resolution set to expire, one on January 29th and the other on February 2nd, so that work has to get done in a very short uh, time frame. Um, as we know, the supplemental for <coughs> Ukraine and Israel is being held up by a dispute over Republican demands for new border control policies. Um, it looked as if nothing significant was going to occur in that area a few days ago, impasse had been reached, but as of the last 24 hours, it now seems as if the Biden administration is willing to make uh, concessions on, on border control issues that may bring along the Republicans. The danger for the Biden administration is that there is the threat of a revolt by progressive Democrats if they go too far. It's a very difficult needle to thread um, they're deeply involved in negotiations right now, and that's why the Senate is coming back next week. <clears throat> the Senate believes, Senate leadership believes, that there is in fact um, a, a potential for a deal on Ukraine and Israel. So that's going to continue on um, for next week. Um, on the on the CRs, uh, remember we have January 19th for the first set, for the first CR, and then February 2nd for the second CR. The January 19th CR includes the termination for two years of the dish cut that we are facing, a 30 to $40 million issue uh, for Santa Clara County. February 2nd, uh, CR in, uh, includes the labor HHS, HHS appropriation. The House Freedom Caucus has shown some flexibility in uh, minor flexibility, I would add, in dealing with this issue under the new Speaker Johnson, and that they're willing to accept somewhat higher spending levels than they were under Speaker McCarthy, but um, there's, the, the parties are still very far apart, and there's just a very limited window to deal with this issue in, um, in, in January. Um, one of the key issues 
that we may hear more about is how to handle uh, IRS uh, spending cuts that were agreed to last spring that were supposed to be repurposed for other domestic purposes to help uh, the, the domestic programs balance out. Um, the Freedom Caucus is saying, yes, we'll give you higher higher spending, but we're not going to allow that IRS repurposed money to be used. And that may turn out to be a key issue for uh, January, because without repurposing the IRS dollars, the domestic cuts are going to be far too large for the for, for most uh, House Democrats. So there's still a long way to go on, on a budget deal. The other issue I would just mention briefly is, uh, is the House passed a few days ago a bill called uh, Lower Cost, More Transparency Act. Um, the vote was bipartisan. The margin was 320 to 71. This is a bill with several provisions that deal with uh, providing consumers with more information about the cost of hospital services, labs, imaging services, all designed to make consumers smarter, s smarter about purchasing services. But there's also a, a provision uh, in this bill that has had broad bipartisan support uh, to crack down on pharmacy benefit managers. These are the very large organizations um, that uh, manage the pharmaceutical benefit for insurance companies and, and major employers. Uh, they're supposed to hold down costs, but the, um, in recent years, it's become more and more apparent that they have not been as successful as many would like in holding down costs. And in fact, because of the way they operate and the lack of transparency, they've been actually retaining more dollars for themselves than most uh, people who know the system well would consider appropriate. This bill would um, create um, reporting requirements for PBMs and make it more difficult for them to game the system. Uh, and, and that's a, a key provision of the bill that, that drew bipartisan support. The bill also includes a two-year cancellation of the pending dish cut. Now, it passed the House, big margin, that's good. The Senate has uh, two bills that are similar in nature, but the House and Senate are very far away from reaching an agreement that will probably occur at some point next year, but there's a lot of negotiating yet to be done. That completes my report. Happy to respond to, uh, to questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Margol. Let me see if we have any questions. Supervisor Lee. None at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. McGullen, as always. Thank you, Mr. McGullen. And just uh, 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 one piece, uh, uh, not, not much related to this uh, committee, but just since you mentioned the supplemental appropriation that involves funding for Israel and the Ukraine uh, defenses, uh, do I recall correctly that Taiwan is also part of that uh, package? Yes, okay. it is. Thank you. All right. Supervisor uh, Lee, if you're amenable and if there are no speakers on this item, which I believe there were not, then we will simply ask for a motion to receive the report. So moved. Motion by Lee, second by Simidian. Aye. Call the roll. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, we covered a lot of important ground today, and I appreciate everyone's commitment. Uh, before we let you go, uh, Ms. Lorenz, I was remiss because um, what I should have said uh, when you were sharing the recognition that our organizations, plural, has received, our organization has received and the various pieces of our organization is congratulations and thank you. So congratulations and thank you. And uh, thank you. Uh, it's nice to win awards, but it's even more important to remember that what that reflects is uh, real impact on the lives of people in this county every day. And um, as we went by it quickly, I thought, shouldn't go by that quickly, should stop for a moment and say so. All right, thank you. With that, and without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a good day.